out a few uh, rules uh, as normal. So before I begin, can I remind members, witnesses and persons in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phones? Uh, members are requested to ensure that for the duration of the meeting, the mobile phone is turned off completely or switched to airplane, say for flight mode, depending on their device. It is not sufficient for members to just put their phones on silent mode, as this will maintain a level of interference with the broadcasting system. Uh, before, yeah, we're now going to meet with members and representatives of ICBAN, and you're most welcome here today, both those who are giving witness and the, those in the public gallery. Uh, the representative of ICBAN, I'd like to welcome uh, the following witnesses, uh, Mr Shane Campbell, CEO of ICBAN, uh, Councillor Paul Robinson, Chair, uh, Councillor Pat Trainer, Councillor Alec Baird, uh, Mr Adrian McCreish and Mr Owen Doyle. You're very welcome here today. Uh, in addition to the witnesses on the panel, I'd also like to welcome, as I said, members of visiting delegation who are in the gallery from all various member councils. Uh, firstly, the format of the meeting is that we will hear your opening statement uh, before going into a question and answer session uh, with the members of the committee. Uh, I'd just like to say the two members have had to leave, but will be back, Maureen O'Sullivan and uh, Senator Frank Feehan. Um, I want to bring to your attention, witnesses, uh, that you're protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence uh, you are to give to the committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect that parl the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members are also reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment and criticise or make charges against either a person outside the House or of an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'd now like to call on Mr Robinson and Mr Campbell to make their opening statement. Thank you, Chair. And committee members for inviting us to meet with you this afternoon. We very much appreciate the opportunity to engage with you on challenge and opportunity for cross centre border region. We attend with a delegation of 15 representatives, all from eight member councils in our cross border partnership, and evident of a strong interest and shown by each council in cooperation cross border. The other members of the panel now can briefly introduce themselves and after. ICBAN Chief Executive Mr Shane Campbell will read out the opening statement. Yeah. Uh, okay, good afternoon. Chair, my name is Adrian McCreish. I'm a director of Mid Ulster Council um, and I'm here as part of the ICBAN region. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Shane Campbell, Chief Executive of ICBAN. Good afternoon. Owen Doyle is my name. I'm a Director of Service with Cavan County Council. Good afternoon. I'm Councillor Pat Trainer uh, from Monaghan County Council and I'm Joint Treasurer of ICBAN. Good afternoon. Cahirla Alec Baird, uh, Councillor and from Ananoma Councillor and Director of ICBAN. So maybe we go on with the witness statements. Thank you, the, the Irish Central Border Area Network is a local authority-led cross-border development partnership which works in the area of the island known as the Central Border Region. The eight council members of the partnership are Cavan, Donegal, Leitrim, Monaghan and Sligo, Armagh City, Banbridge, Craigavon, Fermanagh and Oma and Mid Ulster. The partnership has been advocating for common solutions to common cross-border problems since 1985. The region, though largely rural, contains some larger urban centres. It is remote from national or regional capitals, and as a consequence, the area and its communities are regularly overlooked in terms of investment. ECBAN's area of focus is in promoting and developing cooperation between member councils and their communities on matters of cross-border and regional development. And there's been a positive history of collaboration between the local authorities and their communities. It has been delivered in spite of often historic back-to-back -back development shortcomings. 
The ECBAN partnership instead works against this in joining up planning. And a recent example has been a joint submission to the Regional Spatial and Economic Strategy of the Northern and Western Regional Assembly. And to explain some of the challenges and issues being faced in the region, <clears throat> the need to foster cross-border cooperation is now even more acute given the challenges of Brexit. As a byproduct of the Brexit process, the border has been front and centre in discussions and media coverage. Indeed, the questions of the border and cooperation have been elevated to levels not seen for many years. With the potential implications of the UK referendum decision to exit the EU still to be finally determined, it is considered that the area of these islands which is most likely to be significantly impacted will be the central border region. Even though the border areas could eventually see some communities within the EU adjoining what will become areas then not within the EU, the issues of maintaining cooperation across the border will remain. The Central Border Region Councils have reaffirmed their commitment to cooperation, despite what happens. One notable issue is the important role that local authorities must play in the continued delivery of local services. Whilst national governments and political attention will likely continue to be focused on Brexit for some time yet, the delivery of local services to citizens must continue. In the vacuum of Northern Ireland executive, local authorities in Northern Ireland continue to play a key role in the democratic functioning of government. Through engagement and joint delivery and community planning, for example, and its focus on the economic and social elements of well-being, the impact on local services could be minimised. And cross-government supports to this developing role would be welcomed. In over 20 years, the partnership has helped lever significant investment into the region and cross-border projects between local authorities have had a positive impact on local communities. The significance of these investments on both sides of the border can't be underestimated. And given the importance of the challenges in the times ahead, the continuation or replacement for such cooperation funds must be a key priority. It's vital that a high-level strategic focus is prioritised for the wider border region by both governments and involved in the EU where appropriate. It will be considered that whilst important, EU programmes can only marginally make a difference to lives and the economy of the area. A much more intensive and encompassing intervention over and above any such EU cohesion funds would be necessary to help resolve long-standing issues which still challenge the fabric of border life. It is hereby recommended the considerations given to developing an island-wide territorial cohesion policy which would include a cross-border infrastructure and investment plan fund to replace any loss of common interreg and peace funds. However, there is little evidence of such a debate or consideration yet on either side of the border, which is very concerning. Brexit, though, is not the only significant challenge facing the area. There are pre-existing infrastructure deficits which existed before Brexit and still remain. There has been a lack of attention to the centre border region and in the national planning framework, which highlights supports for other regions, including adjoining border areas, by comparison. Brexit reinforces the importance of giving recognition to the centre border region, and we hereby ask that the committee explicitly identify and promote the region as an area of national importance. We can in discussion later explain the untapped potential of the area as an economic driver. Such designation must be reinforced by a national commitment to address the identified strategic infrastructural shortcomings and address historic underinvestments that would enable economic growth and help mitigate impacts of any negative Brexit outworkings. Component areas of such a policy already have precedence for exploration. For example, in 2014, Centre for Cross-Border Studies published a scoping study into the creation of a cross-border development zone, an initiative actively supported by our partnership. The objective would be to promote the economic development of the cross-border zone on a coordinated basis, maximising the use of national resources and stimulating the use of local resources and expertise. There will be three component parts, spatial, structural and institutional. The spatial examines three spatially defined areas, one being the central border region. Businesses need a modern, effective transport infrastructure through which they can get goods to market. And whilst there have been improvements across the region, there remains important strategic projects which have not been sufficiently advanced and thus hinder potential regional growth and regeneration. The ways and means must be found to accelerate their delivery. The wider area includes sub-regional pockets where key industries, including engineering, manufacturing, tourism and agri-food. In planning terms, it should be recognised that it is not just about connecting large urban areas, 
but it's also about connecting centres of production with customers, workers, supply chain. The, the spatial approaches that we take should and must be reconsidered in terms of development. There's a high dependency on travel by road in the region. In the absence of a real network, strategic road corridors are key for access and movement. Both governments must formally recommit to the long-planned A5N2 Dublin to Derry dueling project, highlighting its priority nature and re-pledging what was originally agreed. Elsewhere, upgrades are needed to the N16A4 Sligo to Balagoli, the east-west link to Dundalk, the N4 from Sligo to Carrick and Shannon, and an extension of the N3 to Cavan Town. Also, the A29 from Coleraine to Monaghan must be highlighted as a key road corridor for north-south freight movement and agri-food, minerals, engineering and quarry products. We can explore later the challenges of these freight movements and the impacts those have and the challenges for the area. There is evidence to suggest that the border area has not received its fair share of infrastructure investment compared to other regions. For example, a review of Transport Infrastructure Ireland investment in road schemes suggests that spending per head of transport infrastructure is only around 45% of that of other regions. If the disproportionate spending pattern continues, the border area will fall behind economically, amplifying the issue of a three-speed economy. Just turning to broadband. The lack of broadband connectivity is one of the most pressing and concerning issues for the councils. Improvements are critical to help maintain competitiveness and to realise economic and social ambitions. It's vital that the peripheral rural areas are not left until the end. There are real concerns about the pace of delivery of the NBP. The ambitions were first promoted in 2012, and the delays will see that the latest delivery targets of 2022 will not be achieved. Related to this, equally ambitious programmes must ensure mobile communications coverage is also effectively delivered. However, there doesn't appear to be any effective joint planning of these two platforms and mobile connectivity isn't even referenced in the MBP. Our small towns and villages could flourish again because they would be effectively future-proofed. That would enable many businesses to operate in rural areas instead. Reducing congestion on Dublin, just an hour away, offering the added attractiveness of idyllic locations, leisure, recreation, cheaper living, less crime. Delivering on that national broadband plan is critical. Border region, communities and businesses can't wait another seven years. And as interested commentators, we would encourage that if the broadband plan can't be advanced further to delivery in its current format, that an alternative solution is quickly realised. It's not too late for consideration to be given to a north-south alignment, given that the need in the stage of development to enhance broadband is at a similar stage in Northern Ireland. Indeed, it could be very timely to yet look at potential all-island solutions and synergies in the same context of the strategic approaches to all-island energy. There's collective local authority support for opportunities to promote slow tourism markets such as cycling and walking, utilising the interlinked greenways across the border region. For example, we've developed business case by four councils for the Sligo to Enniskillen Greenway. These are prospective areas of growth and aided by the requisite government investment can increase overnight occupancies and visitor spending. And the business case for the Ulster Canal highlights its many positive outcomes. It's been regularly referenced in cross-government agreements, including Project Ireland. It could be delivered on a phased basis to minimise short-term demands on public funds. And all the cross-border councils directly involved promote it. This committee's highlighting of support for that phased development of the canal and those key greenways will be welcomed. Just in conclusion, this afternoon we set out some of the key needs and challenges facing the central border area. We appreciate the committee taking the interest and would welcome representations and support within government. It's indeed a critical time for the area. There are new rising challenges, but it could be argued that the border area's weaknesses should have been more strategically addressed in the advent of peace and the end of conflict. Now is the time to address them. As can be seen through our sizable delegation here today, this is a collective issue for all eight of the area's councils. We're not here asking for government to solely resolve the issues, but we're seeking overarching high-level interest and assistance to help us as local authorities tackle these through cross government, cross sectors, cross border and cross community. And we, for our part, as a partnership of local authorities, are ready to play our role. Often when we engage government, we're challenged that cooperation must happen locally first. There are many examples, such as 
The UNESCO Marble Arch Caves Global Geopark between Cavan and Fmanoma. The reference statement of common good and planning between four local authorities. The four council plans for the Sligo to Enniskill and Greenway. And this collective attendance today, we're, that's proof of the commitment by local government. Our local authorities bring resources and energies, and we genuinely need the recognition and the support of central government to help realise the area's untapped potential. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, now I'll open it uh, to the floor. I just firstly want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Deputy Senator, or Senator uh, David Wilson in the gallery, and particularly to welcome uh, the visitors with the delegation, um, starting first with Michelle. Cahirlock, um, um, thank you, uh, Paul and Shane, for your um, very concise presentation. You're all very welcome. I'm delighted to see you all here today. Uh, I think this is a region I know well, um, having grown up beside the border uh, in Ochnacloy and um, between Ochnacloy and Caledon, and uh, know all too well the challenges that have faced the region. And it's worth remembering that when the border roads were closed, a lot of them in the early 70s, the last two border roads to be reinstated were only opened in 2010, a long time after the Good Friday Agreement and um, only a few years before the imminent Brexit. So we don't know what the future is likely to hold for the region. I think your presentation, Shane, has touched a lot of the issues that are very close to my heart, whether it's rural roads, broadband, uh, the greenways, the Ulster Canal, there's an awful lot in there that I think if we were able to bring about all of the things that you talked about, we'd have a very dynamic region. I suppose I want to ask you, um, in spite of, of all the challenges, we have one of the things that, that wasn't mentioned, and I know it's outside your remit, but I want to, to put it on record here today. We have a, a very unique and special thing in the stroke unit in the hospital in Enniskillen, in the Southwest Hospital. We have one of the best units on these islands. Um, the stroke unit, uh, stroke patients are often treated within 10 minutes of coming into the hospital with lysis treatment. So I want to put on record that the, in spite of all the challenges, we still can be world leaders in, in what we do. But can you tell us, Shane, in terms of the, bo the, the border itself, you have Nuri at one end of it, you have Derry at the other end of it, and the bit, our bit is the big bit in the middle. How do you see the rurality and the lack of infrastructure and everything? How do you see Brexit um, uh, affecting us in the future and in trying to, to hold on to what you have achieved over the years and ensure that we don't roll back from that? I'll take a uh, second one, and uh, Alex Maskey is indicated, and then we'll come back and... Oh, sorry, Francie. Sorry, sorry, Francie. Uh, uh, it's the beard. Uh, all right. Sorry, Francie. Go back, I can the, uh, well, First of all, Alex will be in, in with that audio. Um, first of all, you're very welcome, and, and thank you very much for, for coming along today. It is a very important subject and very timely, I think, for to get your um, views on what's happening at the present time. And just looking at what has happened over the last while, and we talk on the line of the commitment to the AFI, for instance, and unfortunately this week we've seen the lack of commitment from the Taoiseach on that one, and I think worse again, using it as a political uh, football in relation to that. But the AFI, and is there any indication from European angle of what actually can be achieved and from the role that you play within the, uh, the border region, and particularly from ICBAN. And I say that as a, as a member of ICBAN in the past, of actually having sat in the committee, and I, I know over the years the, the good work that actually has been done in trying to build the infrastructure right across that area, and in some senses to, on a purely commercial basis, to actually try and utilise the border area. The other one is actually the A29, and uh, I know it doesn't directly, in, in some sense, deal with it, but when you look at the, the map, there is actually no direct link north-south, uh, and it's a zigzag of roads back and forwards, uh, and unfortunately, development both north and south has been from east-west, uh, and very little north-south. So I think that that's an area that we are going to need, uh, particularly in the cross-border angle. But, uh, and the big one, I think, that uh, you haven't mentioned, maybe, uh, it's um, the circumstance of it, but is the interconnector. 
Uh, and from Mid Ulster's point of view, the interconnector is probably one of the most crucial issues that we actually need to be in place as quickly as possible. Because the uh, engineering sector that everybody knows and appreciates the work at, and the job creation that actually engineering has created in particularly Mid Ulster but right across the West, that has been curtailed at the present time because business can't expand any further. I was at a meeting recently in the Rock and from Roy where three companies were trying to divide up the electricity supply between them. So the 900 kilowatts, whatever it was, between them, and actually each one of them were looking at all, but it couldn't be got. So they're, they're working with generators, they're working with a makeshift situation. If we're really serious about expanding west of the ban, which we have complained about for so long, then we actually do need the interconnect to be in place. Otherwise, we, uh, in the Cookstown and Marfelt and west of the ban, there will be no supply in, in 2020 uh, if we don't actually get that connection. So th that's one area that I, I think just that we need maybe to refocus on to try and see what can be done to get that in place as quickly as possible. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, before I hand you back, I think uh, the words of um, Simon Coveney were that the A5 has been postponed, and I think that was reiterated by um, uh, the Taoiseach actually in the Dáil today. So do the witnesses want to... Uh, avail of the opportunity to respond to the two. Chair, if I respond first and then others may, may come in and I may also, I may not touch on all of the points. I'll cover Brexit and transport. Uh, myself and others might touch on an interconnector, may come in on Brexit and transport, but I pick up on a couple of those points and I might even present you with something here if, if you have the time to look at it. It's not about what will the impact of Brexit be. Brexit's already impacting. Um, we carried out a study last year with Queen's University Belfast. It was supported through a project through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trades Reconciliation Fund. And we engaged with 600 people and businesses across the border region. Three quarters of them expressed that Brexit is already impacting on them. In many ways, in terms of confidence, in terms of uncertainties, businesses that are um, putting off job expansions, uh, young people who are rethinking their education choices and their, their direction of travel and, and where they would go and, in, and where they would study. Uh, in terms of investment in and around the region, we've come across many case studies such as that. So we, there would be concerns about, obviously, Brexit. I suppose we're all concerned until we find out well, what will the final direction of travel be. ICBAN, as a cross-border group, is representative of the different political interests on both sides of the border. Uh, and we recognised, and the board took the very mature uh, attitude, that it wasn't going to be an ICBAN about rehashing arguments over such as, well, should it be remain or, or leave or whatever, but that there is this pressing issue that we as a board have to be collective. And that collective decision and policy of the board was to work together, respective of those opinions, to withstand any negative consequences arising from Brexit on the border region. And that has been to gather and share those stories and we've presented them to, to the MPs, the, the TDs, the MLAs, the Senators. In terms of those issues are being expressed by people across the region and we're delighted that they have been reviewed here by the highest levels of Irish government, by UK government and by the negotiating team in, um, in Brussels as well. If I can for a moment then turn to transport, um, and Chair, if I could, would it be possible to share this with you and with other members of the, the committee? Maybe I might pass these over. Um, and just to highlight what the issues are in this region. Well, if you want to pass a few on. When we talk about A5, N2, A29, they're among seven key roads in our area, as this map here will illustrate. There are 45 million vehicle crossings annually, and 11% of those are heavy goods vehicles or light goods vehicles. There is the same number crossing from north to south. Across the border region in a year, you could estimate there are some in the region of 4.5 to 5 million freight crossings across that border. Now, in the map that you can see there in the bottom left, you can see the key border crossings. Our area includes border crossings D, E, F, G, H, I and J. That's the central border region. That's the geography of the area. The northwest, 
and the east are also shown there separately. In the bottom right, when you add up the percentage of the total goods vehicles crossings by those routes, give or take maybe one or two percentage points, I'm trying to work it out, 35% of the crossings happen in the central border region. And about a third and a third, so nearly a third in the northwest, a third in the east and a third in the central border region. That's the A5 and two, that's the A29. That's the key industrial belt that we have that comes from Midney East Anthem right down through Mid Ulster, down into Monaghan and Cavan. That is an area that is overlooked in government policy. When it came to the national planning framework, there was scant mention of this region that we inhabit. The North West City region is profiled, yet it is the same number of freight movements. And the East Corridor is profiled significantly, obviously, because of the Belfast to Dublin link in your region dock. And the argument that I make is not about the central border region against the North West or the East, but it is to say that the entire border region in terms of government policies on both sides of the border is not being collectively considered. And that if we don't address the issues of the central border region and consider that in terms of just even this one economic indicator of freight movement and travel, we are not effectively balancing development across that border region. And we could be sitting here again in another 20 years' time saying, well, what are we going to do about the border? The central border region is as important. We may have seven routes. There may be two or three in the east and two or three in the northwest. But when you look at it, it is as economically important. And you could even argue that probably a lot of the traffic does not come through our area that should be coming through our area because the roads are deficient in comparison to other areas. That is a collective case that must be made for these eight county areas to be considered in terms of government policy, and to date has been missing. I, I will leave it at that, Chair. Let others come in. Uh, Councillor Pat Trainer, you indicated you wanted to. Yes, just to agree fully with what uh, Shane is saying there about the concerns that Brexit and the prospect of uh, Brexit would, would raise for our community. Uh, I represent uh, a community and, and live within a mile or so of the border. And uh, up until very recent times, uh, people didn't want to even engage around the issue because there were so, it, it was a, 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 such a... a, a um, it's such a hurtful experience trying to uh, remember what, what happened in the past. So uh, we would ask of the Good Friday um, implementation, the Good Friday Agreement implementation committee that you know all elements within the Good Friday Agreement are, are used to try and defend our uh, rural border community, including the, uh, the one which relates to a border poll and investigating all possible solutions to the, the Brexit issue and particularly the border issue. There's been major um, media attention and I know that the, our local community have done numerous um, programmes, interviews, uh, explaining statistics and explain, local businesses explaining that uh, in the recent past they've withdrawn or withheld for their investment and for the development because of the uncertainty, so assistance uh, is, is um, needed there. While we uh, welcome the attention and focus and investment on, uh, on we'll say, the eastern part of the, the border and the northwest, we feel that we're, in many ways, left similar to rural Ireland. We're that centre border area, that rural community on both sides, that have uh, our communities on both sides have suffered neglect over the years, and, and we need a, a bit of focus uh, on that. In relation to Michelle's question around the health issues, vitally important, and uh, ICBAN, with the help of the likes of um, the uh, um, cross-border committee, what they call the Basin Arma, um, uh, you know there have been reports done about the the positioning of uh, emergency hospitals and all of that. We've been developing. Uh, Response to emergencies uh, with the through the ambulance service being able to travel, the fire brigade have advanced greatly in res in, in coordination and dealing with emergencies, fire, uh, road traffic collisions, and the like in in our region. And uh, you know we're getting to the point where people are ignoring the border and just delivering the services that the people deserve. Um, 
the interconnector and the energy, and as Shane mentioned there in his presentation, the importance of the All Ireland strategy, energy strategy, and where it's developing uh, the particular infrastructure that Francie mentions are, um, is that interconnector, the 400 kg interconnector between Meath and, and County Tyrone. It goes through County Monaghan, the eastern part of County Monaghan, and indeed, as, you, as you're all probably aware, Airgrid and Sony have made that, have turned that into a very, very controversial project. There's major local opposition to it being overheaded, opposition to uh, pay, about 300 pylons along the way. And landowners, I have been at public meetings where the landowners, uh, 300, 400 people, very determined that they will not allow the um, construction over land of that project. There is fully acceptance that there needs to be the interconnector, that the All Ireland Energy Strategy is a good one and protects us all and delivers for us all. But uh, any um, authority or any um, influence you might have, I would appeal that you would use it to try and force Airgrid to go and consult and listen to the local community. Undergrounding is possible. We've been to Europe, uh, we've been to Brussels, we've investigated a similar project in between Belgium and, and Germany and, and heard from Eli, the company responsible there, the, the possibility. Um, Public confidence for them, we've learned from that project, public confidence is the first requirement of a successful um, infrastructure anywhere in Ireland, and, and particularly in the border region. Uh, that's vital. Thank you for this session, uh, Mr. Adrian McCreish, and we, most of the other members want to contribute, so I'm conscious of time. Okay, Chair, I, I, I will be brief. Okay, thank you. Um, c colleagues, I, I want to pick up on uh, a number of comments made by, by uh, Ms Gildenu and Mr Malloy in relation to potential investment and the impact of investment within this region. And I'm minded, uh, Chair, as I look around uh, and as I met my colleagues outside, uh, we verge, as a, as a group, we verge across nine counties of the 32 counties of Ireland, uh, north and south. So this is a sizable landmass. Um, and equates to about one-fifth of the entire land mass of the island and one-tenth of the entire population. So when we talk about the central region, we are talking a significant element of this island, north and south. And the reason I say that is because many of us are of the view, and I'm a practitioner in economic regeneration for 29 years, and I'm of the view that all we have ever asked for in our part of the world is a level playing field. We have never asked for a handout. We've always asked for a leg up in order to equate a level playing field. And my ask today is exactly that because I know, I genuinely know what we could do had we decent roads, if we had decent technology, if we had decent access to investment and decent access to labour and skills development like all other areas have enjoyed over the last 10, 15 years, 20 years, Chair. And I also say that because two things. We have particular characteristics in our part of the world. We do not have public sector investment. We do not have the luxury of relying on significant public sector jobs. So what have we done? We have created our own jobs. And our people are the entrepreneurs of this island. We are the enterprise capital of this island. We are the ones that have created the greatest, biggest, boldest, broadest exporters on this island in spite of the lack of investment north and south that we have experienced. So our ask is very simple. In any regional economic strategy, please focus on where the entrepreneurship is. Please focus on where the creativity and the enterprise is, and we will demonstrate to you by way of delivery what we can do with a level playing field. And in spite of poor roads, in spite of broadband, and in spite of all the deficiencies, we are very proud people. We boast a significant element throughout Tyrone, throughout Derry, throughout Monaghan, throughout Fermanagh, civic pride, economic pride. We have pride in our families and our communities, and that is what keeps us going through the bad years and into the good years. But we also say this, we do not want repeats upon repeats of emigration and losing our young people again and again and again. This is an opportunity through this strategy, Chair, on the southern side of the border to make a substantive investment in the central border region. And we 
ask and expect that that will be forthcoming, not just because we deserve it, but because we will significantly return on the investment fivefold, tenfold, or maybe more. Could I just say there's two more witnesses who indicated you can feel free if you leave something out to come back in when the other uh, speakers come in, but we'll take both Owen and then Alex and then we'll uh, revert to uh, uh, Deputy Ferguson after that. Thank you, Chairman. Just very briefly, i just say two things. First of all, I just want to you know, impress upon all of you here you know, the, the strength of the collaborative offering that is here today. You have local authorities, north and south, very familiar with each other, an excellent track record of delivery and a desire to work together. That is evident, obviously, through ICBAN, but through our regional assembly, through offerings such as the use of partnership, which is piloted by my colleagues in Leitrim County Council. You have local authorities who are ignoring county boundaries and looking at the regional whole and delivering where they're given the opportunity. As my colleague has said, we're only looking for the opportunity to be able to play on the same uh, playing field. I just make one other point, and I think it's something which uh, the members would uh, want me to do, is that in the context of the peace programme, We've had, for many years now, a peace investment program in the border counties. It's different from the way local authorities work in other parts of the country, but it's an integral part of the way we work. It's soft uh, working between communities in conflict areas, communities that haven't actually met each other in generations, who are now working on community projects, who are working uh, on enterprise projects. It is a hugely important part of the story, the success story, since the Good Friday Agreement. And we would strongly encourage members of the RAFTA to emphasise the future importance of peace working and the peace programme for local authorities in the years to come. Uh, Alex Baird. Uh, I hope you accept that Ulster Scott greeting in the spirit it's given. Uh, Michelle mentioned about uh, the border roads. It's just a point of information and that lately they're only two reopened. Uh, from my point of view, before I went into politics, I was a civil servant working for the Northern Ireland office, and my title was civil representative. And in actual fact, uh, in the words of Michael Caine, not a lot of people know this, but my role was the, uh, at the stage after the Good Friday Agreement was working with road service to ensure all the border roads were reopened. So I'm only too well aware of the difficulties that were caused by the, uh, the closure of the border roads, and none of us want to go back to see that situation again. I'm surprised that it took so long to, for uh, not, uh, the two that Michelle referred to, but I think there was a bridge involved in that. But I just wanted to get that information in, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Tony Ferguson. Don't uh, Tony McLaughlin. The names are all confusing me today, but I see an Alex over here. Sorry, Deputy. <laughs> Guests and, and representatives from from, uh, from the nine uh, areas that we're, we're talking about. First of all, I'd just like to say that um, what what I've listened to here today, being a, a representative uh, TD for the constituency of Sligo Leitrim, uh, I'm very well familiar and very very aware, and also as a, as a previous uh, councillor in that area, to know of the uh, the deficiencies that we have had in that area. And I know that you're highlighting. Um, both north and south, and it's it's it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you here today because uh, engaging with yourselves and indeed with, with with your colleagues and the local local authorities in the area to uh, talk about issues and particularly the infrastructure. And of course, I have always said as a, as a TD here that when I see the the northwest and and uh, it's the the divide between uh, the west and and the east when I see the investment and uh, what has taken place over the last number of years, uh, we don't have any any. Uh, uh, investment such as that uh, in our area, unfortunately. I know that we have an announcement, um, a very, very fine announcement, Chairman, um, made last week to me uh, on the N4, that's the road between Sligo and, and towards uh, Carrigan Shannon, 121 million uh, of, a, of an upgrade, which is starting uh, very, very shortly. But I think that there are many other uh, areas within our uh, constituencies that uh, lack uh, funding and lack. Uh, I suppose, uh, initiative to get, to get moving on. And I would think that perhaps maybe um, you mentioned there also um, infrastructural investment uh, other than uh, roads and that, but I think it's, it's important that we would uh, certainly, and I suppose you being here with us today and us as committee members, to listen to your concerns, and, and certainly there are major concerns in, in the area. I suppose uh, you did highlight as well, not only just on the, on the road infrastructure, but also in relation to uh, the broadband, which is a major, major issue in the area for businesses and indeed for everybody uh, living in, in those areas that, that has got to be um, dealt with. And I 
think the greenways, I mean, we have huge potential there for tourism and indeed for, for people in relation to, you mentioned there, the Sligo in Eskillen uh, through Manor Hamilton, uh, the Greenway in, in my area, and also cycling and walking. These are the ways forward, and you're right, that we need investment, but we need uh, clarity in relation to um, where this funding can be um, made available. Because I know that I've been sp speaking, and particularly with uh, an old deal, Brexit, I would be very, and we have spoken about this, uh, Chairman, over the last while at some of our meetings in relation to uh, perhaps maybe uh, the lack of maybe interreg uh, funding uh, going forward. Uh, that's an issue, uh, I suppose, the economic development of our, of our area as well. But I think that uh, we need, um, within the border areas, and this is the area that we're um, talking about here today, that is vitally important uh, going forward because uh, I speak to uh, haulage contractors and uh, certainly these people are very, very concerned and have been for many, many years, but equally uh, more concerned now with um, a no-deal Brexit um, perhaps uh, happening very, very shortly. So I'd just like, perhaps maybe you might just make a, make a, a comment on, on, on some of those issues, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. I take two follow, uh, Deputy Brendan Smith and then Deputy or Senator Crockwell, and then go back to... Witnesses. Deputy Smith. Um, thank you very much, Kyle Like others, I welcome the delegation here, and I want to um, compliment Shane on the quality of his contribution. It covers a very wide facet of all activities in our border region, and very comprehensive and a welcome. I also want to, to compliment you on the publications that you have produced over the past number of years in conjunction with Cathy Hayward of Queen's University and actually Declan and myself, and, or De Deputy Brannock and Deputy McLaughlin and myself, as members of the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, would have had Cathy giving evidence to us in committee session at, at, at those committee meetings as well. And I know, and Owen Doyle and Pat Traynor would be aware as well, that as Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Oireachtas, I brought um, parliamentary delegations from abroad to Cavan and Monaghan, um, including the, House of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Commons, and we drew widely in the presentations that were made both in Monaghan and Cavan County Council, drew widely on the publications from ICBAN. So I compliment you on those indeed. Um, I passed on our thanks to Councillor Paddy O'Rourke when he chaired ICBAN for the, the quality of those publications at the time. Um, mention was made of the delivery of health services, and Deputy Brannock, as chairman of the North Eastern Health Board, was instrumental in bringing Koch about when an agreement was signed in Ballyconnell in July 1992, I think it was, and that particular initiative has worked well, and indeed we'd like to see it expanded, so we would. With regard to waterways, and you quite rightly mentioned the potential of the Ulster Canal, and I would also like to see uh, the Erden navigation, or the Erden system made navigable from Beltorba to Kilikeen and Kilishander, building on the Erden Shannon Waterway, formerly the Ballyconnell Ballinamore Canal, as Councillor O'Rourke would, would know so well. We both live quite adjacent to that area. It has been phenomenally successful. Um, the Waterways Ireland were here with us on the Locks Agency, and obviously they have a very limited budget. They don't have the budget for the capital investment that's needed, never mind um, rolling out new product or em enhancing product just to keep product maintained because of the usage of the waterways. There's huge pressure on their capital budget, but we have to keep um, pointing out the potential of the waterway system in our area to grow considerably tourism numbers. I know very well in the late 1980s and early 1990s when the restoration of the Bellyconnell and Badenmore Canal was mooted, there were a lot of cynics in a lot of political parties and organisations at that time who said it would never work. It has proved to be phenomenally successful. Likewise, the Ulster Canal will be when it's restored, I think. With regard to the A5N2, again at this committee, even before Brexit, we had Transport Infrastructure Ireland here on a number of occasions and officials from the Department of Transport, because as a committee, we, we were very concerned that it wasn't moving along, the commitment wasn't given in regard to the necessary pre preparatory planning and design work and work, particularly in County Monaghan on the N2. It has moved on somewhat, but again this week it was disappointing to learn that that particular funding allocation, that, that that may not be available at the present time. We would sincerely hope it, it will because it's so important for the northwest of the country. 
which would get, you quite rightly point out is an issue that we have been raising here as individual members and in discussions in the Dáil with regard to Brexit is the very high dependence of our local economy, particularly in the, in the Cavanagh and Fermanagh Tyrone area, Leitrim as well, the huge dependence on the agri-food sector, construction products and engineering. And of course they are the three sectors that are more highly dependent on the British market than elsewhere. And, the, and, and so I, I know some of those sectors have already, as you quite rightly pointed out, being, have been impacted by Brexit. So any fluctuation in sterling, any weakness will cause immediate difficulty. But our key sectors are the sectors that are most vulnerable to the adverse impacts of Brexit. That has to be a source of concern for us. And other colleagues and myself, we have argued with the with ministers and with the Minister of Transport in particular, that if we are to try to help industry and business in our region to remain competitive, we have to invest in infrastructure. To try to upgrade infrastructure, it can reduce costs somewhat, but if you don't have a modern infrastructure, it's an extra impediment and cost to business. So it's a message that, that, that we would heartily endorse in, in your particular present presentation here. With regard to, you mentioned about um, territor island-wide territorial cohesion policy. Again, the, as we all know, the, the European funding is post-2020. CAP, we'll hear about that funding for CAP post-2020. But the overall budget for the European Union goes in those multi-annual cycles. And again, and maybe you would, would, would draw some proposals that we, we could help to to advocate in relation to would be that we get a specific cohesion fund. In the past, you will remember the debate in, in this state in particular in regard to objective one status, etc. The huge growth in the economy in the 1990s and the, and the, two, the early 2000s um, changed the status of some of our regions. I think, again, we should be making a very strong demand for our region, north and south, to get specific cohesion funding because of the challenges we will face as a result of Brexit. I think it's a very important area. Maybe more work could be, if more work can be undertaken by ourselves in relation to how we can push government here and government elsewhere to support specific proposals to draw down cohesion funding. Because you take some of the countries that acceded to the European Union in, in the mid-2000s and subsequently, they have had infrastructure um, upgraded significantly with true co cohesion funding. We should argue again that we are a special case, and I, th I, I, th I think it's, it's very important in that respect. But could I just say, I, I compliment you, and I also know that you have done very good work in regard to the whole issue of broadband infrastructure and the lack of it and the mobile telephony problems we have as well in our area. And I compliment you on that publication. But what you are saying here to us today are issues I'm sure that all of us can readily agree with and support. And again, I thank you, Shane, and all of you who have contributed here so far this afternoon. Thank you, Akhai. Thank you. We'll go back to the committee, uh, uh, Adrian. Uh, there's further two, and I'm conscious that we have, this, we have another presentation later, so I want to be sure we get to both Dep uh, Senator Black and Senator Crockwell in to, for their contribution. Okay, so, thank you, no, Chair. We'll take, we'll take these two first, and then we'll come okay. back. Yeah. Sorry, Adrian. Much of your presentation uh, today, it's just you know, it's refreshing to hear that you know that you're all all the councils are working together um, cross border. It's 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 wonderful to hear, and you know, I suppose you've touched on a lot of issues. The area that I'm specifically interested in, and, and maybe one or two of you could you know touch on it, um, with with the impending doom and gloom of of Brexit. Um, I suppose you did mention, you know, local services, um, and from your perspective, what's it like with regard to mental health? I mean, are they being impacted? Are mental health services being impacted? Are addiction services being impacted? Um, you know, as councils, how do you see that, um, you know, come to fore? Like, how do you see it uh, just kind of opening up in a way? And I'm sure the piece, the interreg funding is probably going to um, impact that as well. Um, and then also just, I suppose, you know, are you concerned for the 
for the Good Friday Agreement, you know, for, you know, would you feel concern around that? And then from our perspective, and I'll keep it short, um, how do you feel that we as a committee can support you? And that's what I'd like to see happening today is that we would, well, I would love to be able to think that we could support you in the great work that you're all doing and the great work, the fact that you're all working together is, is very powerful. So that's it. Sure. Finally, Senator Crockwell. Uh, thank you, Cahir. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say, as a member of the European Affairs Committee as well, uh, I've been most impressed uh, by the feedback that we get from Europe, from uh, members of European Parliament who have visited the border area and who have been briefed, uh, in some cases, by members uh, from your own councils. Uh, I've found nobody in Europe, no matter how far east you go, that is not aware of the Irish border and the issues surrounding the Irish border. So you're to be complimented for that. Now, one, one of the things Shane touched on there was border, you know, cross-border development. And this is where, I'm afraid, I come with a rather negative uh, view of the world. Uh, my fear is that Brexit, whether it's a crash out or whether it is a negotiated one, will change the relationships that exist in the border region forever. And, um, if we were to look for a solution to the Irish problem, maybe we would step out of uh, London and Brussels and come back to you guys and let you guys find the solution, because I think he would have a solution in jig time. Um, questions. Uh, we've met Francis uh, Black brought us to Cushendall some time ago. We met a haulier up there who will relocate to the Republic of Ireland if there is a negative impact in Brexit on his business. Uh, what sort of fears have you got for businesses relocating out of Northern Ireland into the Republic or elsewhere in Europe in order to maintain their businesses? The other, the other thing is the mismatch of funding uh, that bothers me. In the, uh, once Brexit comes through, European funding will be guaranteed through the southern side, if you want. The Irish uh, government will continue to push for financial support for various projects along the border. But there is a possibility that the UK will not provide equal funding. And you then finish up with a mismatch and uh, you finish up with a poor relation the other side of the border. You could, for example, finish up with uh, a decent motorway in Donegal that stops at the border. And uh, I remember years ago travelling to Northern Ireland, you knew you were in Northern Ireland because you hit the best roads in the country. Uh, now you know you're in Northern Ireland because you hit the worst roads in the country. And uh, somebody mentioned particularly the central area of the border. Uh, I would drive to Sligo uh, rather than try and cut up through uh, the, across the border. So the mismatch of funding is something that concerns me greatly. And have you considered uh, local authorities, for example, on the other side of the border, if they lose businesses, they lose rates, they lose funding, they lose taxation, whatever else? Um, so that concerns me. Have you had an opportunity to make a presentation similar to what you're making here today to members of uh, the Westminster Parliament? I know the House of Lords have been fairly active, but uh, have you had an opportunity to speak to MPs apart from the MPs that are here today? I'll leave it at that, Chair. Uh, Deputy Sullivan, are you, do you want to say... If, uh, I won't. Yeah. Just to apologise, I had to leave to go to the Chamber. I did read the papers that you had sent in beforehand, but I won't ask a question for fear it has been asked already, so I'll listen to the replies here. Thank you. I think Adrian indicated first. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, you will understand that I, I will uh, stave away from the political side of the Brexit, and I'll leave that to my colleagues here. I, I just wanted to make two comments, Chair, in relation to... Deputy McLaughlin on some of the issues that Deputy Smith touched on from the economic impact um, and how, what can we do to shape the economic future going forward and I suppose the role that European investment can play in that. Um, it, w w without being negative, um, I, I too have been involved in uh, developing and acquiring and securing European funding and trying to get it targeted and invested uh, for economic regeneration activity throughout local government, uh, both in an urban and rural setting. Um, and I've been extremely grateful for, for that opportunity and that experience, and it's had a wonderful impact on my part of the world in East Tyrone and South Derry. Uh, that, that being said, I will say this. Um, there is a big difference, Chair, between cross-border activity and border-specific activity. 
I'm going to make this point, and I want this to be as positive as I can make it, but I'm going to be critical here. Um, I get a wee bit, uh, it grates me when people talk about cross-border activity and cross-border investments, such as interreg funds and so on and so forth. In 2015, my, lo my local authority, uh, I and my elected members, spent a lot of time doing a very comprehensive response to the previous interreg programme and the forthcoming interreg programme from 2015 to 2019. And whilst we welcome investment and the hundreds of millions of pounds that was coming through the interreg programme, we warned uh, the European Commission that it completely and utterly uh, does not in any way, shape or form attempt to address urban plight, urban deprivation, urban dilapidation or indeed rural dilapidation. And whilst innovation and R&D both at academic level is wonderful, and wonderful for universities and academic institutions who have availed fantastically well through interreg programmes. I'll ask a very simple question. Go to the border and walk through Newton Butler or listen to Ski, or walk through Emmyville, or walk through Carrick and Shannon, or Ochnaclory, and show me the benefit or the actual outworkings of the millions of pounds of interreg. Look at the empty shops, the empty buildings, the dilapidation, the dereliction. There is a wrath of work to be done in border towns, border villages, both urban and rural. We're probably going to get one or more chances in our entire career to get it right. So I'm here today, Chair, to say I welcome cross-border cooperation and everything that Deputy Smith and McLaughlin has said but be reminded that interreg funds going into academic institutions in Belfast is not addressing rural and urban deprivation and decline and emigration in the multiple border towns that, quite frankly, when you ask the communities, will say they saw no discernible benefit. So my plea, you ask what can we and what is our ask, our ask is very simple. There's a regional spatial strategy being developed. If we're talking about cross-border, let's make it border-specific, okay? Not exclusively, but inclusively. And let us really go down into Monaghan and Cavan and Leitham and Tyrone and Fermanagh and down and dirty into the border regions and the border towns and say, what are the issues, what are the problems, and what needs to be done to deal with it? And effectively, we do that, Chair, in seven years' time, perhaps, I'll be here in a more positive demeanour. Thank you. I have three, three of the witnesses are going to pass, then Owen, and I'll get Shane to wrap up, if that's all right. Yeah, and uh, just to mention uh, Senator uh, Francis Black's issue there around mental health services, and I suppose in our region we suffer, similar to every other region, the lack of investment. I think in... Um, um, uh, through the uh, PPNs, the uh, public participation networks at local council and social inclusion policies, we're starting to deal with excluded people, people excluded for all kinds of different reasons. And I think there is a particular uh, understanding that some of that would be people who are not involved in, in, in citizenship in everyday life because of, of mental issues. But, um, you know, again, um, uh, there's not near enough focus on it. And that brings me to the relation you asked about the Good Friday Agreement and the fears. Other aspects of the Good Friday Agreement, particularly for the likes of the implementation body, are other um, uh, articles and sections of it that deal with civic participation and, you know, civic forum and the feed-in for com for, from community uh, representative community groups. And there was a great rush after the Good Friday Agreement of community groups meeting on both sides of the border, dealing with common issues. But very quickly, two things happened. One, the run into the jurisdictional, the legal differences. And secondly, then, funding was cut in by about 40% for their involvement. So there's a frustration there, but I know a willingness at that level to get back engaged and stay involved. The, um, another aspect of, of uh, the implementation of the agreement, while we talk about all of the economic developments and, and progress that has been made, uh, the other aspect around um, reconciliation and peace building that isn't as measurable is the fact that we as councillors are working together on the issues that affect us. And uh, trying to address the problems uh, does help to create uh, 
uh, trust and respect and appreciation for other people's uh, where they're coming from. And that all feeds into the, the outcome of the, the Good Friday Agreement. Confidence does below at times because we're 20 years on and there's quite a lot of the Good Friday Agreement which you know, people really raise people's hopes and expectations. <coughs> And uh, you know we need to do more work. Confidence does does uh, drop at times, and you know the work that you are doing is vitally important for us all, for the country, but particularly for building relationships. Now, just it struck me that this while we're here to represent ICPA, and it's notes notable that you know uh, um, Alex of the Ulster Unionist Party, myself as a Sinn Féin party, uh, Paul as the DUP. We represent and work together around all of these issues, and sometimes when you're watching the TV news at night, you wouldn't think that's possible, but it is. And, and you know, we've we've uh, uh, grown to know and respect and uh, appreciate each other's points of view. Councillor General uh, Owen. Yes, Chairman. Just very briefly, Chairman, uh, just make three brief points. Just to emphasise the fact that we're uh, how proactive this partnership is being in terms to get the message out to Westminster and those uh, the decision makers. Uh, in recent times, uh, through uh, primarily through the offices of Deputy Brendan Smith and his chairmanship of the Foreign Affairs Committee, we've had very high-level delegations from Westminster visit the region, Cavan and Monaghan. They've stayed in Cavan and they've met with the people and businesses on the ground. Likewise, we've had very high delegations from the French Parliament, uh, the German Ambassador, and next week the Maltese uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Ambassador will be visiting the region also. So, I mean, the message we want to say is that we are being proactive in selling the needs of the, the region to beyond this house and to wherever we feel it would be productive. In terms of relocation, um, I think the sense of it is that there is very strong evidence of businesses not being in a position to expand or to radically change their business models. And the, the, the principal worry that we would have is that the withdrawal of markets or the, the, uh, the creation of obstacles to markets may well actually pull the rug from uh, strong, what are currently very strong businesses. I suppose just finally, in relation to relations, just to emphasise again the strength of the relations that are within the local authorities and the communities that are present. And that is testament to the Good Friday Agreement of what it achieved for the country. So I suppose it behoves us all to ensure that that's not undermined in the future. Your own uh, and Shane. Sure, I'll pick up on a couple of other questions that were raised <clears throat> in terms of broadband and the importance of that. Yes, it is to be welcomed, the announcement by ERA this week of uh, the investment into those uh, towns and areas with more than a thousand homes. It's, it's great to see that happening and that will impact on our region. But what is missing is still the hard to reach areas. It's the rural areas, the areas that it essentially is across that covered by this delegation. And we await with interest uh, the delivery of the National Broadband Plan and the results of that tendering process. And we would hope that then that, that can be linked into mobile connectivity proposals, as, as we've seen being talked about. But that must be delivered across a region such as ours because you're moving into areas of inadvertent roaming, where you, when you're crossing the border, you have a drop in signal. That's not good for business, that's not good for people, that's not good for homeowners living on the border whose phones are uh, constantly moving in and out of roaming charges. And if Brexit comes to pass and the UK leaves the EU digital single market, we're back to a charging regime that again puts the region at a competitive disadvantage. So that must be engineered out as it can be through licences. In terms of the, the Ulster Canal, the Ulster Canal, yes, could be a fantastic project and has been one that has been long advocated by this region. And we have no doubt that if it did get um, the required investment that it would, could be a huge success. We only have to point to the example of the geopark between Cavan and Fermanagh and Oma. Um, and something that we probably need to shout about a bit more. It, it is the largest single visitor attraction in the border region with some 400,000 visitors. Yet uh, I appreciate that Fermanagh and Oma and Cavan would never have thought originally that could have been what we could aspire to. That growth potential is there in the border region. Um, the ability to deliver good projects is there in our region. Um, our sectors are interlinked. That's a consequence of, yes, those sectors of agri-food, engineering, manufacturing within that area that we have, that they are interlinked. But that has been what has been developed 
I suppose, come back to the Good Friday Agreement and the open of relations and the work that groups such as this and, and people such as yourselves and committees such as this in bringing people together. We would have a concern that border relations would be affected and could be affected because of the, the wider discourse around these issues. However, what Iqbal proves is that you can bring together, as Pat said, Sinn Féin, UUP, DUP, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, SDLP and others, and work together on a common agenda where politics is left essentially outside of the room and where we can work on the, the common issues of that time. Um, just to, to finally cover a few final comments, mental health, yes, is a big issue in our region. And we, we found that through the research that we were doing on Brexit with Queen's University. We have community planning officials from the region who meet regularly, and their next meeting next month is on mental health and about looking at the issues affecting the region and to start really digging down into it. And that's issues that have been led by the local authorities, the LCDCs, the community plan and partnerships respectively in each jurisdiction. Um, we're not here to complain that this region has always been left out. We're here to say that when the investment has been made in this region, we do deliver. The facts are there. This region is as busy as the other border regions. It's great to see them so busy and getting support. We're saying, let's fill in the missing link, which is the central border region. We have the key centres of production. Adrian talks about the enterprise focus, the enterprise centre. Mid-Ulster, to pick the one area, is the biggest single contributor in Northern Ireland, an area to gross value added, to those indicators in terms of manufacturing outputs. And we look at the industries right across our area, down into Monon and Cavan, and then going west into Leitrim and Sligo, that SME, that thriving small business economy. It is an area of 750,000 people, approximately. It is the biggest cross-border area. It is the area with the most crossings. That's its complexity and that's its, its richness that, that we work with. We also offer an alternative to the traffic congestion in Dublin. The report yesterday that Dublin's what third most congested city in the world after Bogota and Rome. We're only an hour up the road with fantastic life. And if we have the final investments in roads in terms of connectivity or even in broadband, which means that people don't have to commute, 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 in terms of creative economy and the solutions we have, those can be delivered. What we would ask from the committee in conclusion is it's helped with profiling the importance and the value of the central border region. It's, it's to engage with you as the area's deputies as well, uh, and with you within your political parties to ensure that you are profiling the central border region as being important, that we have it as raised as much in Irish government and in Northern Ireland government as, as possible, that we want to raise it as much in Westminster in future as possible. And Adrian talks about the work that we've been doing around re regional spatial strategy, and we put together the basics of our presentation, the basic presentation that we gave today is based on a collective response to the regional strategy. And that's because we feel the national planning framework has ignored our region to a large degree. If we could have some support or some assistance within government that would provide us with some funding or help or assistance to develop and build upon our spatial plan, our economic policy resolution, and how these areas could be more effectively knitted together we could turn an area that has a hugely untapped potential into a huge economic driver because it's holding its own with other areas, while the end yet it is the area that is most neglected in terms of investment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I get uh, Chair to sum up, I just uh, haven't asked a question myself and sometimes prefer to be sitting down there to be able to ask other ones. I just, it's in relation to, uh, you have the North West, you, we are going to have a presentation after from East Border Region, which is part of my own area, and, and your, your presentation here today. I just want to ask the issue of, I suppose, and it was referenced earlier by Adrian, the issue of, of, of being recognised fully as a region in terms of a collective unit. Do you see merit, and it's a question, do you see merit in coordination and facilitation of effort of the three groupings working together, uh, identifying the various sectors that are important to your region that may be totally different to the East Border or, 
or maybe similar, but to make sure that, let's say, just taking one simple example, if it's the education sector, that, that Letter Kenny Derry work on, 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 on specifics that are needed in terms of uh, programmes there, whereas the DKIT and DCU may be different and slightly different in your own area. The question is, if we want to get additional monies from Europe in a post-Brexit situation or otherwise, is there merit in that whole facilitation? And we do have uh, the Centre for Cross-Border Studies and others offering guidance, and Deputy Smith referred to you know, the universities helping and whatever, but to make sure that we maximise the, the, the spend and the investment to make sure your region or the other two regions survive. Does anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I can come in and say absolutely. And there has been cooperation between the three border areas. There could be more, and it would be good to also probe and ask that question of the other border regions. Central Border Region has always been open to engagement. Central Border Region has backed the idea uh, developed by Centre for Cross Border Studies of a border development zone. There are many examples where issues can be tackled border region wide, and there are examples that we lay out today that must be and probably have to be tackled as a central border region. But absolutely, yes, we would be very keen to engage. Uh, Chair Paul. I'd just like to thank you again for having us here today. And uh, to do with the, the Brexit, I think we need a bit of common ground in this whole thing here between North and South and between the UK on Brexit. We need to get cheap trading as we are already doing without any tariffs or anything at all. So I think we need to be negotiating between each other. And come to that, thank you very much. Oh, well, good. Uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to uh, particularly thank uh, the witnesses. I'm particularly uh, impressed at the visitors that have come with you, which shows the importance of that collegiality and, and people having a voice here. I think it's certainly in my time, it's the biggest delegation that has actually uh, come into the, into the gallery and just to reassure you that this won't be the end of the engagement uh, the secretariat are in the planning program we intend to have an outreach visit uh, to your region shortly I can't indicate exactly when but it will be uh, obviously the, the importance of brexit at the minute is probably taking a precedence but certainly devil and the secretary here in the process of planning that so we hope to spend maybe a lot more time with you over a day or two you know, seeing the issues in the same way as uh, Senator Crocker referred and, and Deputy Smith to the, the importance of the visitation of Europeans to see uh, how the border operates. And I can assure you, as somebody who has walked and lived the border, uh, I, my, my concluding remarks, I often tend to close my eyes for a meeting group and say, if you weren't, didn't know who the particular grouping were, if you didn't know what their faith was or what region they came from, the problems are the same whether it's in the northwest, in Iqban, or in, in, in the northeast, it's a question of identifying them and working with them collaboratively and in that collegiality that was referred to by many here today. And I, I finished by saying to Alex, he talked about Ulster Scots. I developed Ulster Scots in Dundalk. Thank you. Thanks for your time. End the meeting for a couple of minutes, obviously, to allow into uh, public session, uh, the usual House rules uh, in advance. Um, we're obviously meeting with uh, the representatives of East Border Region, but before I begin, I need to remind members, uh, witnesses and persons who may come into the public gallery that they turn off the mobile phones. Members are requested to ensure that for the duration of the meeting, mobile phones are turned off completely and switched uh, to airplane safe Flight, safe or flight mode, depending on your device. It is not sufficient for the members to just put their phones on silent mode, as this will maintain the level of interference with the broadcasting system. This afternoon, we are meeting uh, with representatives, as I said, of the East Border Region to hear about their work and the challenges they face. I would particularly like to welcome uh, Ms Pamela Arthurs, the CEO of the East Border Region, uh, Alderman Arnold Hatch, Vice Chair of the East Border Region, Councillor P. Joe Handlin, uh, Councillor Terry Andrews, uh, Sharon Gagan, Alderman Alan McDowell, and uh, Det Hughes of Border Region, I think with apologies from uh, Damien O'Reilly. Um, 
The format of the meeting is that we will hear your opening statement before going into a question and answer session with the members of the committee. Also, before we begin, I want to bring to your attention witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence you are to give to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are only entitled thereafter to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. Uh, you are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her uh, or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice, the effect that members should not comment on criticise or make charges against either a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Um, I'm now going to begin by asking uh, Pamela Arthurs to begin with her opening statement. Yeah, actually, Chairman, if you don't mind, Councillor O'Hanlon, oh, yeah, no, followed by Alderman Hatch and then myself. All right, so in that order, that's great. Yeah. Uh, uh, Councillor P.J. O'Hanlon. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee, for inviting me here today to present the work of the East Border Region. The Ireland, Northern Ireland border area is currently the focal point of the Brexit negotiations. And much mention has been made of the peace process and the need to protect the Good Friday Agreement and all its part. This is in no small part due to the proactive approach taken by local authorities along the border in the wake of the June 2016 referendum. East Border Region is a genuine cross-border organisation. Three local authorities in Ireland and three in Northern Ireland comprising elected members from all political parties, north and south, chief executives and senior officials from the six member councils. The post of chairman rotates annually north and south, and East Border Region was the first cross-border group to elect a DUP chair. Apart from the institutions set up under the Good Friday Agreement, there are very few other genuine cross-border organisations in the island of Ireland. Other examples include the North West Region, ICBAN, Centre for Cross Border Studies, and COTS. Cross border cooperation on the island of Ireland is relatively young. The impetus came in the 70s from local elected representatives in the border area, both north and south, who recognised the value of cross border cooperation. The North West Region in 1995 and East Border Region in 1996 were the first cross border organisations on the island of Ireland. It's important to note also that cross-border cooperation at this time was not fashionable. The policies of both government was back-to-back -back development. And to quote one of the founding members of East Border Regional Councillor Jim McCart, who lived in Warren Point in County Down, back in the early 1970s, there was literally no cooperation at any level, political or otherwise, between local authorities adjacent to the border. And I quote, I didn't know any of the councillors in Omid despite the fact that I could look out my front door and see Omid. It simply wasn't the done thing. Councillors and officials who are members of East Border Region work under the shadow of the wider political situation. The political climate made it difficult to attend meetings across the border, but local representatives persevered because they quickly realised that back-to-back -back development was not working. There were areas of common concern across the border, there was a strength in working together and that the border area was more disadvantaged on both sides. Working on a cross-border basis was extremely difficult throughout the 1970s and 80s. There was absolutely no funding from either Dublin or Belfast, as cross-border cooperation wasn't fashionable, but East Up Border Region has always worked under the backdrop of the European Union. Indeed, it was the European Union in the early 1990s which first provided financial assistance for cross-border development in the form of the Interreg programme and the subsequent Peace programme. Whilst there are over 70 Interreg programmes across Europe, the Peace programme is unique to Ireland and Northern Ireland and demonstrates the commitment from the other EU member states to peace in Northern Ireland. Since the 1990s, Substantial EU interreg and peace funding enabled the transformation 
of the Ireland, Northern Ireland border region both economically and socially and ensure that local authorities were at the forefront of cross-border economic development. EU funding enabled East Border Region to be more outward-looking, to share and learn from colleagues in the other areas across Europe, and to realise that the Ireland Northern Ireland border area suffers similar problems to other border regions in Europe. Whilst the Good Friday Agreement was a catalyst for further cross-border cooperation, it is important to note that cross-border cooperation has never been easy and must not be taken lightly. Over the last 40 years, the members of East Border Region have believed that cross-border cooperation makes sense. In the face of Brexit, it still makes sense. Capacity and trust has been developed amongst both elected members and officials, and East Border Region has built up an excellent track record in the management of EU funding. East Border Region has always adopted a bottom-up and needs-based approach to cross-border cooperation with the views of local authorities and key stakeholders in the region are paramount. This strategy has been extremely successful, as Alderman Hatch will now outline. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Councillor Peter Hannan. Uh, uh, Alderman Hatch. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Chairman and members of the committee, good afternoon. Nice to see some, I was going to say old faces, but faces I've known for some time. Uh, East Border Region is currently financially managed, is managing eight large strategic interreg five projects to the value of €93 million. Euro. An application for a further €9.2 million is currently being assessed by the Special European Union Programmes Body. All of these projects are highly innovative in nature and the EBR is delighted to play a pivotal role in them. I have circulated a copy of our latest annual report which provides members with some detail on each of these Interreg 5A projects. I hope you find that interesting reading. East Border Reason has been involved in all of the Interreg programmes to date, drawing down millions of euro for a host of projects which have benefited communities along the entire border corridor. This money has contributed significantly to the modernisation of Ireland, Northern Ireland border corridor. To give members a flavour of the types of projects EBER are currently implementing, I will outline a few examples. We are involved in two greenway projects, one from Newry to Carlingford, linking into the already existing greenway from Carlingford to Omeath, and the other one from Smithborough in County Monaghan to Middletown in County Armagh. These are two genuinely cross-border greenways which will have a huge positive impact on the cross-border region. The current application of 9.2 million is to install a necklace of 73 rapid electric vehicle charges along the Ireland Northern Ireland border, and also to include the western coast of Scotland. This is a highly strategic project involving organisations such as the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, Ulster University, DKIT, and the local authorities along the border corridor which seeks to raise public awareness and increase the use of electric vehicles. As well as working with our local authorities, EBO have entered into strategic partnership with a wide range of key stakeholders who are implementing Interreg 5A projects. This includes organisations such as Irish Water, Northern Ireland Water, Intertrade Ireland, Ulster Wildlife Trust, as well as a number of universities in Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland. EBR provide a unique service to these projects in respect of the financial management of the EU funding, thus ensuring all expenditure is in line with the programme rules. The Co-Innovate programme led by Intertrade Ireland will assist 1,409 businesses within the Interreg 5A eligible area and is particularly useful in the current context of Brexit. As a result of this collaborative approach and the expertise which has been developed over the years, of managing EU funding, EBR have built up strong networks locally, nationally and internationally. We remain an active member of the Association of European Border Regions, AEBR, which is a network of cross-border regions across Europe. EBR are respected by government departments in Ireland, Northern Ireland and in Brussels. We have also developed good working relationships with the SEUPB, 
with TDs, Senators, MPs, MLAs and MEPs. To quote the former Secretary General of AEBR, Mr Jens Gab, it's, he states, EBR is an indispensable link in the Europe-wide network of AEBR. This cross-border cooperation has contributed to remarkable positive economic and social development in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and created verifiable added value. Whilst there is no doubt that the myriad of EU-funded projects which have been drawn down over the past 25 years have significantly contrib contributed to the growth of the border economy, there is no room for complacency. Over the past 40 years, EBR has displayed an astute ability to adapt to the many challenges which have faced the organisation at both a local and national level. This flexible approach and pragmatism displayed by local elected politicians and local authority senior officials has ensured that EBR has survived where other similar organisations have come and gone. In the face of the Brexit challenge, it is essential that we adhere to our core principle to promote sustainable cross-border economic development which benefits all the citizens of the region. Brexit, however, will be a game chamber changer, but I will now hand over to our Chief Executive of many years, Pamela Arthurs, to discuss this matter further. Thank you, Arnold. Pamela. Thank you, Alderman Hatch. Yes, as we've said, um, the Ireland Northern Ireland border corridor will be most impacted by Brexit, irrespective of what type of Brexit we end up with. I would even suggest if we didn't end up with Brexit, there would still be there's a, a, an impact there. The impact will be an economic, political and social level. Economists agree, despite the supports which you've heard about, which the border region has received to date, it still lags behind the rest of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Economists also agree that Brexit will exacerbate this situation. Business in the region is already less confident, it's more reluctant to expand as the future is so uncertain. Current developments of Westminster have compounded this problem. This has already been evidenced and on the 4th of December at a Brexit event in Dublin, Dan O'Brien, the Chief Economist of the IIEA said, whilst employment growth overall in Ireland is good, employment in the border region has faltered since 2016. Whilst Brexit has highlighted many needs which already exist, it has also highlighted further requirements in the future. So what has been the local authority response to Brexit? In the immediate aftermath of the referendum, once we all picked ourselves up off the seats, um, local authorities began a sustained lobby in order to highlight the needs of the people of the East Border region. We began in that respect. But it quickly became clear, however, we needed to work with our colleagues along the border because this is a border issue north and south. Particularly with the absence of a government in Northern Ireland, local authorities along the border felt it necessary to articulate and to lobby for the needs of the one million constituents of the border region. This report, Brexit on the Border Corridor, which I hope you all are familiar with, um, on the island of Ireland, risks, opportunities, issues to consider, and was commissioned by the 11 local authorities which make up the Border Corridor. Facilitated by ourselves in East Border Region, this report brought together the Chief Executives of the Councils right along and uh, clearly identified that the economy of the Border Region currently lags behind the economies of both Ireland and Northern Ireland. It also outlines that the border will be most detri detrimentally affected by Brexit. So what were the recommendations of that report? We need to address the structural weaknesses in the border region. Upgrade infrastructure, transport, broadband, assist connectivity in the region, ongoing business support measures to assist business prepare for and deal with the impact of Brexit. The majority of businesses in the border corridor are small. Indeed, many of them are micro, less than 10 employees. They do not have the money or the time to prepare for what they think might happen as a result of Brexit. The uncertainty will see um, many of those businesses go to the wall. Um, the focus on relevant skills levels in the region is also important. 
and some kind of Brexit transition pro programme along the lines, say, of a territorial cooperation programme, something to assist the border region to adapt to the challenge of Brexit. This needs to be broad-based because Brexit impacts every sector. And continuation, I don't think we care who funds it, but continuation of the EU-type funding programmes, or alternative funding programmes, the broad range. We're talking here, and, and we've, we're most familiar with the Interreg programme and the cross-border group, the Peace programme, but the Horizon 2020, the Rural Development, the Erasmus, a raft of programmes that we are going to lose in Northern Ireland. Um, so going forward, however, we believe in East Border, and you've heard Alderman Hatch say we've always been ready to adapt to change to the particular challenges of the border. We need new policy. We need new thinking. We need new methods of cooperation and partnership between the local authorities in conjunction with central government. That's very important. Central government, Ireland and Belfast be essential for border management to work in the wake of Brexit. I think it's also important to note that, to date, the majority of the uh, funding that has come into the, the border region in terms of cross-border has come from Europe. It hasn't come from, from the governments. There's been some funding from Ireland. There's been nothing really from Northern Ireland. The money that has come in in the Interreg and the Peace, which are cross-border programmes, has come from Europe. Now, the, the, both governments match, you know, so they could argue that, but I mean, the, the, the impetus and the drive has come from Europe to date. The 11 border local authorities now want to work with both governments to develop and propose creative solutions for border management. Local authorities along the border want to develop a bottoms-up, needs-based strategy for the border corridor to offset the challenges and identify any opportunities associated with Brexit. Bear in mind that along the border, the, the northern border councils, there are members in those council areas who believe that there are opportunities. And we must take the mandate of all of those elected representatives. So as local authorities, that's, that's what we will do. Um, so this fresh strategic approach, it should be endorsed by both governments to practically support the border region. This isn't about, um, you know, uh, airy, fairy, this is a requirement. This is about practical, what do we require? The strategic piece of work will build on this report. And tomorrow we're actually meeting, the, the chief executives along the border are meeting with um, officials from the Department of the Taoiseach and from the Northern Ireland Executive to drive this forward. Um, and what we want to do is, is to use this to establish priorities for action. We need to engage with local stakeholders, with social partners, with business. It's needs-based. Um, it must take account of the, the, the uh, people of the area. Consider implementation structures and sources of funding. Very important. Whilst local authority staff and elected members have the knowledge, they have the commitment at local level, some aspects of the work may require a more regional approach. There may be um, issues which are identified which can best be tackled at a border corridor level. There may also be issues which um, are pertinent, particularly to the east, to the central border or to the northwest. And I think the strategy which we, we are uh, commissioning as we speak um, will identify that. So you'll have your border corridor wide, your high level requirements, and then within that, your, your priorities w within each, each region. High level support and commitment, I know I'm repeating myself, but from both go governments is essential if this approach is to be successful. Existing local authority cross-border groups, you've heard from our colleagues at Ban beforehand, ourselves, the North West, are well placed. We have the proven track record in terms of coordinating, facilitating and managing any dedicated intervention in respect of this approach. But it also needs to be led at top level, as this approach is, by the chief executives of those 11 local authorities and th then that it can be carried out. But they require the resources now, the groups, in order to do this. 
In my view, the solution suggested by the Border Corridor local authorities, which is still bottom-up, it's needs-based, driven and delivered locally, essential, has the best opportunity for success. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pamela, for your presentation, and PJ O'Hanlon and, and Arnold. Uh, I'm now going to open it individually, and the first uh, person to uh, want to ask questions is Senator Gerard Crockwell. Uh, thank you, Kerr Hillock. Um, firstly, thank you for coming here today. And secondly, um, Councillor Hanlon, when you started your presentation, you reminded me of how local authorities can overcome all sorts of things, working together. Um, you know, sometimes things are driven locally that nationally we couldn't dream of, of, of driving. And, and I'm mindful of the fact that Councillor uh, Keoghan, who's there as well, uh, the day after, I think, the referendum, you, you were on the phone to me about uh, demanding resources for local authorities for the border region. So, I, I mean... There is serious drive at local level, and I'm delighted that I got uh, your presentation. Not one of the three of you that presented presented anything negative. Uh, it created an air of cooperation, which feeds through to what I have had from various ambassadors. I'm a member of the European Affairs Committee, so all of the ambassadors speak in glowing terms of the way they were treated on the border and the way they were briefed on the border. Uh, that would be the same uh, as all of the um, parliamentary delegations that have come to Ireland. They have gone away in no doubt, in no doubt. Michel Barnier himself speaks uh, about the border with a, a level of passion that you wouldn't expect from a foreigner. And that's down to the work that has been done by uh, local authorities in the area. However, the day after the referendum, I wrote a piece on the border. And I, I'm afraid it was negative. It was anything but the positivity that I've heard from you people here. Because whether it's a hard or a soft Brexit, it will change our relationships forever. I fear. I'm not so convinced after listening to Councillor Hanlon and, and uh, Alderman Hatch that the change will be detrimental because I think you'll find ways of working around things and that's important. But my, my concern, and we ha had it from the last witnesses, a lot of the money that has gone into Northern Ireland uh, since 1998 has gone into high-level academia and various other things. An awful lot of money isn't coming down to the ordinary level. Uh, you mentioned infrastructure there. My fear is that uh, in, in uh, a mismatch of funding post-Brexit, the infrastructure on the, the northern side will change to the detriment of the development of the economy or the continued uh, sustaining of the economy the way it is right now. So I'd be interested to know what your view is, uh, Ms Arthur, specifically with respect to how you see the UK matching funding from uh, the EU, because I don't see EU money going north of the border, if you know what I mean. Um, the, the, the other thing is flight of industry. Um, it would be so easy, uh, and I'm sure the councillors from the, the south will accept, it would be so easy for a company that is on the wrong side of the border for the want of a, a, a definition post-Brexit for those companies who want to remain in the European Union to just slip across the border and set up offices in Dundalk or in Drogheda or uh, in County Meath. Uh, and we have, we have met uh, businesses in Northern Ireland who have said they are going to do that um, if their business is uh, interfered with. Uh, and the only other thing I'll say to you then is my own group of independent senators went to Belfast before um, uh, Christmas to meet with the business community. And they tell us the only thing they want is certainty. They don't care whether it's hard, soft or any other kind of thing. They just want certainty so as they can start making plans. Uh, have you had any negative feedback from uh, businesses in the area? Because clearly this shows that there is huge commitment to the area. Have, have the businesses come to you and said, look, at, uh, you know, we're in trouble here. So I leave it at that, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, who wants to start with Pamela? Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of money coming for cross-border cooperation from Westminster, I would not be very hopeful about that at all. 
Um, and I mean, one example I can give you is that um, a group of MPs in Westminster um, are looking into the UK Prosperity Fund, which will um, replace EU funding to date. And we um, were asked to comment on that, and we did, and a number of the, the cross-border groups, and we um, delivered a, a, a strong response in terms of the need for cross-border cooperation. When the actual report was published, there was little or no reference within it um, to cross-border cooperation. And you have to bear in mind that we, uh, the Ireland, Northern Ireland border region will be competing with England, Scotland, Wales, the rest of Northern Ireland, Belfast. You know, we've always been on the periphery and we're still on the periphery in that respect. So in terms of money coming to replace we, the monies from Europe that we enjoy along the border, and bear in mind we are um, punching above our weight in terms of money we've got to date, no, I, I don't see that coming. Um, again, it's back to Europe in terms of they are committed to uh, cross-border cooperation. They have committed, and the, the British government and the Irish government, as you know, have committed to um, seeing out these current programmes and also the Peace Plus programme. And the Peace Plus, Plus programme will be interreg and peace as we know it today. And they have committed, again the EU have committed, that they will uh, fund that programme um, to the value of 600 million. So we know we have that, irrespective of you know, a, a, a no deal Brexit or whatever. And again that shows the commitment of the, of the Europe and the other 27 countries to, and particularly to peace in Northern Ireland. But to, in terms of Westminster, no. Unless, again, we're going to have to do a sustained lobby and try to raise a profile. But bear in mind that Brexit is going to cost money, and there are so many priorities, and probably priorities that will come above cross-border cooperation. And I don't really think that there will be enough money left to seriously look at, at cross-border cooperation and the work that we have done today. And I know I'm talking about economic development and the hard interreg is you can see interreg on the ground and that's good. But the soft, the working together of the members and, and all of that, that comes along with that hard economic um, impact. And that's something that you know, could possibly be lost. But again, I'm hoping that an organisation such as their own with 40 years um, history we'll be able to keep that going. <coughs> but without money, there's always need a carrot. And, and again, as, as Councillor O'Hanlon has said, cross-border cooperation, never easy. You're, you're dealing, you're walking on a tightrope constantly, particularly here in, in Ireland, Northern Ireland, with all our, our history <coughs> or whatever. So it's, it's, it's something that's not easy and something that really could be impacted despite the best intentions of everybody not just here, but on the boards along the border of, of the groups. PJ Arnold, do you want to come in on that? Or are you yeah, the the um, question about industry slipping across the border, I don't think it's simple as that, because it really depends what indust industry you're in. Because if you slip across the border and you set up headquarters in this country, 90% of the companies are probably getting their goods from somewhere in the UK, whether it's Northern Ireland or whatever. So There'll be difficulties if there's a hard Brexit deal. There'll be difficulties, and I think we all accept that. Um, some companies we do know, transport companies, have actually set up both sides of the border, both sides of the river, uh, to, to get the best of both worlds. In terms of infrastructure, I mean, we would see the AFA as being uh, very important to get that started. It's been the goal for so many years. And um, I know Jim Nicholson. Uh, asked a question in the European Parliament this week about Peace Plus, because even that isn't clear how that act is going to be delivered in cooperation with the UK government. Um, so we have to just keep lobbying. I think it's, it's one of the forties of the East Border region. We can lobby mm. right across Europe uh, if we have to. Thank you. PJ, do you want to? Now, just in relation to the points that have been made, and just to follow up on what Arnold has said in relation to day five. I think it's very, very sad that, you know, the first thing that was the go in relation to the hundred million, the first project that was knocked off the board was the A five. And 
for somebody that has lived along the border, who spent two years in Donegal, like the people of Tyrone from Manor Donegal, would they put in the tooth they've been forgotten about? This has been talked about 30, 40 years. It's grand coming down here having meetings and making presentations, but it is quite disheartening for those people that are living in those areas to see what's happening. And you say to yourself, you know, what is this all about? Because serious are we about Brexit? And unless we have a proper infrastructure there, we're not sending a very, very good message out to those people. Like any of you that know, driving from Emmy Vale to Letterkenny, to go up and go back is a four to five, but it's nearly easier to travel from Emmy Vale to Cork than it is to go up to the top end of Donegal. And nothing has been done about it. So if we are going to be genuinely serious about this, we need to be starting to say, look, we're going to invest and we're going to put it in. Yes, we have Brexit and we have challenges. But to knock off a piece of infrastructure that the only part of the island of Ireland hasn't got proper infrastructure was, in my view, not being political, but extremely disappointing. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, Francie Malloy. Okay, thank you very much for the presentations, and uh, I think it, uh, again with the previous group, it's enlightening just the work that is going on and the commitment to delivering that. Uh, as both you talked in relation to the border corridor, and I always thought that it's one of the areas where uh, sort of an economic zone, the full length of the border. So, would you see the sort of the, the three four groups along the border linking up to try and create that? in the future where it may not be necessary maybe to maintain all, all of the group but actually to try and create that economic corridor right across the border on both sides to uh, help it. And would the funding, or have you found any sources where funding may be available? Because I know in, in other um, countries where it's border the European Union, there are some funding across borders for to try and actually alleviate the, the problems on it. And uh, I think that would be useful like, to say if there are examples of that. In the past, just with the Assembly and the Finance Committee, I remember I was approaching the British Government at that time, even in relation to the European Bank, and, and they were reluctant, because they were a contributor to Europe at that stage, uh, they were reluctant to actually to fund uh, too many projects uh, in the North because that they were actually going to have to fund them as well or cross fund them. So I think that's one of the problems we actually have in that situation. But if we can create that border corridor which links up and creates a sort of like a, uh, an economic corridor, all than actually being a border of disadvantage could actually become an advantage to the future. Thank you, Chair. Anybody get us power? Really, I think that is what is needed if we're to properly tackle the, the disadvantage along the border. And many people talk about, well, on the east, you know, you're better off on the east and, and whatever. But there are still pockets of, of deprivation, like, for example, in Dundalk. Um, you know, and, and we talk about our road infrastructure. Yes, our road infrastructure, but our B roads, you know, is, are not particularly good. So we, there are a range of needs right along the border. Um, that is, is what we're doing at the minute with the 11 uh, uh, chief executives along the border. We're looking. What you call it, we don't know. Sometimes it can be sensitivities around the names or, you know, is it a border development, economic development zone or whatever. It doesn't really matter what it's called, I don't think. But it's about identifying those um, priorities, those needs, and getting them funded. But the, absolutely, it's essential. If we speak as one voice, we'll be stronger. And we do have history in this. 20 years ago, the, the three groups, East Border, Ekba and the North West, worked really closely because what our members wanted was that local people make decisions on the then and Reg 3 programme. Some of you might have been involved at that time. And very much civil servants in Belfast and Dublin didn't want to let go of that control. So what was happening was that decisions for the border were being made in Dublin and Belfast. And officials were making those decisions. And we had a, a concerted lobby work together. That was a challenge as three groups. We had a border corridor strategy at that time. And we ended up with 53.9 million out of 180 million programme, which was, Chairman, you'll remember that, which was delivered locally by elected members and social partners. 
To me, that was a high point of cross-border cooperation. Unfortunately, what has happened since that time is the two programmes have become centralised again. And sometimes you find that the pure cross-border local groups are not being funded, you know, to the detriment of, of you know, what the priorities of government are. So I think that even with the Peace Plus programme, we need, as a border corridor, to have elements of that strategy. When we develop that now quickly, and we need elements of that that are going into the consultation for Peace Plus, that those can be funded. The genuine cross-border need should be funded by a cross-border programme, in my view, anyway. But I agree with you entirely. The strength and the impact is in working together. I remember many years ago, we used to feel that when there was only the East and the North West, and competed all the time. And there was always this idea in the East that John Hume gets everything for the North West or whatever. Now this I'm going back many years ago. Um, that maybe wasn't true, but perception is reality. But I do feel, and we did it 20 years ago, we worked together. We became a bit subsumed in the whole interreg and, and the monies and managing that as groups and maybe the higher strategic things were lost at that stage because we're, we're small staff and whatever. But no, the opportunity is there. I believe in the face of Brexit, there is the opportunity for us, as you say, maybe to turn something which is a big disadvantage into um, the opportunity for us mo moving forward. But again, the key point, we need the governments to work with us. We need them to recognise the need in the border corridor as well. And, that, and, and the good thing from the meeting tomorrow is we have the departments here and we also have the Northern Ireland Executive and the, the officials there that, that will be round the table with us and hopefully buying into the, the approach that we're taking. Just before we bring in uh, Michelle, just, just to follow on so that I don't come back on it. I mean, do you, I did ask this question of the previous group, the, the, the issue for the need for facilitation to ensure that uh, joined up thinking in relation to the, how the approach, the economic approach to the the full border region. Do you see that as important? But equally, do you see the issue of, obviously, I did say that a lot of the areas have the same issues, but a lot of them also have uh, strengths uh, and, and, and need to be worked on that, that they can uh, attract funding for what their strengths are. Do you see merit in, in that type of approach? And is there need for that facilitation to happen for the three Groupings North West, Dick Ban, and, and uh, your own East Border region to actually uh, bring this to that plane that it was at 20 years ago to bring it back? I think the situation is that at the minute, and it's probably where it started at 20 years ago, was at the Chief Executive and the Council level, and the 11 of them working together. Um, so that's important that they do that. But in terms of ourselves, we have been facilitating that from just after the, the referendum, you know, and bringing the 11, um, because um, it is difficult to get a date that suits 11 chief executives and to get them round the table. They have been doing that. But, I mean, I think what will happen is, you know, they will agree the approach, um, and then it will be up to, uh, uh, you know, if they decide that there are three groups that will, will develop that for them, because they need, obviously, to work in a cross-border manner, and it is cross-border groups that are the current structures there. So I don't see that they will propose a new structure. We have enough structures there, but it's making we'll best them, use. And as I say, in East Border, we've continually adapted to whatever the need is. We just adapt to to whatever the, the current need will be, and that's the way we'll move forward. But I think it's, it's, it's good and it's best that at the minute it's led by the top level in the 11 local authorities, and that's the message that's going in here to, to government here and in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, in relation to the county I come from, and 80 to 90 per cent of the people employed in it are all coming from small to medium enterprises. And Brexit is a challenge to the whole island of Ireland, there's no question or doubt about that. But to the counties, whether it be for Man at their own, Armagh, Cavan, Monaghan, Donegal, 
that's going to have a massive impact, as you're well aware, compared to Cork and Kerry. And the amount of business and their interaction that I have seen over the last number of years from, we'd say, the likes of Cross and Bother on that there, has developed Monaghan as a county. And all the good work that has been done, all the good work that has been done by East Bother Region and something like that, and to be very frank, I think you're 100% right, something has to be put in place. Because I would be so concerned that the amount of business that is done on the border between those counties would be significantly harmed compared to the rest of Ireland. And I think we can't allow that to happen because it's been so beneficial. And for somebody who has lived along the border, like yourself, Declan, it's been, it's been fantastic to see the way those counties have developed over the last number of years. And unless something is put in place, and whether that's bringing all the groups together as an entity and working together, if that doesn't happen, well, then I would really, really be fearful for what would happen along the border. And I just don't even want to contemplate that. We just can't go back there. Uh, uh, you want to go back in? Yeah. Can I just quickly come back, Chairman, in terms of business along the border? And some of you will be familiar maybe with Flurry Bridge, the business park there basically across the road from the Carrickdale Hotel. Um, and a number of years ago, um, when uh, uh, working in Newry, the cooperative there, and they identified that site and said they wanted to build a business park there. And most people said, who in their right mind would build a business park there? Currently, it employs 300 people, and basically what it has done has taken the small businesses, and it just is small business, taken them out from you know, the barns and wherever around, and a lot of them maybe um, you know, not as legal as they should have been, etc., whatever, but brought them out. Again, it was the EU, it was the European Union that financed that, that said, OK, if the local people feel there's a need there. Now, there's none of those units um, empty. There's 300 people working there. You basically come out of the entrance there, you turn left, you're, you're in Ireland, you turn right, you're in Northern Ireland. And we had a grouping over. We've had n numerous groupings, as you know, over. Um, and these were, were actually from Westminster MPs, and they said to one businessman who's based there for many years, um, you know, why don't you just move across the border? Why don't you just go to, to Dundalk? And he said, because this suits me to be here. Why should I do that? He says, but what I have done is I've leased property in Dundalk, and it's cost me a lot of money, and I hope that I never have to go to it, but that's the approach that I've taken. And he said, many other people in this park don't have the financial resources to lease somewhere and to start there. You know, so that is the reality of what, and I think nearly what the businesses would say to you is, the worst thing is the uncertainty. When you know what you're dealing with, you start to deal with it. But it's this uncertainty, ongoing, ongoing, and it's costing them money. And they're not, and I mean, it's, it's you know, been said earlier in the week, um, businesses aren't expanding. You know, they're not because they just don't know you know, and they want some answers, but they're not forthcoming. Thanks. Um, Arnold, do you want to comment on that? Yes, just, just a quick comment, and really there's a question uh, through yourself, Chair. Is the, in Northern Ireland and the UK, we have city and growth deals going on. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and most of the councils in Northern Ireland are in some sort of a, either a city deal, Belfast, which includes that New Morning Down, and that consortium, the North West, Darien and Saban, and the, the Fermanagh and Oma, ABC Council, etc., are involved in discussing a growth deal. Is there something similar for the regional assemblies or the Doyle that could buy into that concept of, of a structure along the border which could would focus on those border counties? Uh, without answering the question, because we're here to discuss to see where we can bring and improve the situation, and that's not reflecting on the great work that the three organisations are doing. But I think, uh, as I said to the earlier grouping, you could close your eyes here and listen to either, either group, or indeed when you meet people of different persuasions, north or south, and listen to what they say. If you didn't know their names or where they came from, the 
problems are exactly the same. But I do, in answer to your question, as you directed me, I do believe that there is need for uh, a coordinated strategy that I accept that East Border uh, are currently working on with the 11 managers. But uh, somebody, I think, needs to be listening at uh, intergovernmental level uh, uh, and recognise that, as PJ and others are saying, that you know, in the vacuum that's there, or indeed regardless of what happens, whether it's a soft Brexit or no Brexit, uh, that the, the region is, is, it needs nice. impetus, it needs reinvestment. Uh, the peace is fragile, regardless, it's not a throwaway phrase, but the, the, the area needs an e economic injection. And I think collaboratively and collectively, and I got a clear message uh, f from the previous meeting of the need uh, to work together, identify as I said, the strengths that each area has and not re take from those, but to, to work as a unit to get people to, to support the various funding streams in, a, in, a, in, in whether it's Brexit or no Brexit, and that there's recognition that the monies, as, as I think Francie referred to, uh, in, in areas that we, we did have SEBPU in here uh, back over 12 months ago, and they did say there were opportunities uh, for other programmes that were uh, trans-territorial that may not necessarily involve uh, people's membership of the EU, but we have to wait and see. But I do think uh, that there's a real need for uh, a joined-up thinking, and I hate that phrase, in relation to, to getting Europe and other areas to recognise the need for investment of money. Uh, Michelle. Kermia, good. Uh, uh, you're all very welcome. Um, it's been a, a very um, insightful contribution here today, and I'm delighted to see you all down in Dublin for this. I suppose um, to, to reflect on some of the things that were said, and I think, Pamela, you talked about how businesses were saying, if we know, we can plan. And they have been saying that for the past two years. Um, but we're now finding that businesses, there's more meat now becoming on the bones of what is likely to happen post-Brexit. And businesses are finding that a plan is going to be impossible to implement. So, for example, Seamus from the Freight Association tweeted this week that a company had got on to him that applied for 37 licences and got two, for example. One of the businesses in my constituency is, um, you know, the agri-food industry is deeply integrated. The supply chain is, is across the island. And one of the businesses in, in the Ikban region which is a part of my constituency, have primary processing in one part, on one side of the border, secondary processing on the other, and they've been told that they can't import or export. So there's there's all kinds of queries now. So I just wonder what you're hearing in in the east border region around the difficulties that businesses are being forced to, to contemplate, and how you expect them to be addressed. Um, but what I would say is, yes, I agree with you, but I mean, initially, whenever the referendum happened, you've lost the mushroom industry, you know, um, just almost overnight, particularly in County Monaghan, and I know that, uh, Councillor Hannah, do you want to speak on that? No, well, just, in the, you're in a position that, I would say, for the example that Pamela has used is in relation to the mushroom industry. What's happened, basically, for some of the businesses there, this is a result of innovation that has kept them alive. And unfortunately, as a result of the currency and situation like that, some companies and some businesses did go to the wall. But it is a sad state of affairs that the point that you make, and that's not just, as you say, in the Fermanagh area, it's all throughout that there. The food industry is so important for us cross border because of the background in agriculture, businesses, and that there. But what we need to be doing is, and governments need to be doing is need to be making things easier for these people. Like somebody with a freight company making an application, as you said, and I heard that about the volume that we're getting in relation to, we'd say, processed food and stuff like that there. All red tape and everything we put onto it. We need, like, for us to come up here, is we're telling you what we feel are the issues on the ground and that there. But I think it's, Government needs to sit down and things need, decisions need to be made. Like I was listening to a presentation two weeks ago with a gentleman that came from the Customs Union, from the Customs Office, and he was talking about the issues and challenges that were there. Now, 
if we don't have anything put in place for this, and I don't want to be dramatic about this, there is going to be serious consequences for this. And that's no doubt about that. And all the good work that has been done economically in relation to jobs and all that there, that's going to be a serious negative impact. And what needs to do is, whether it be civil servants from Northern Ireland, from the Republic, solutions need to be found to make life easier. It's difficult enough to run a business and make it successful and viable in the current economic climate without putting challenges into it. And my deep concern is two months out from Brexit, and we all know they can probably be kicked down the road. 43 days. 43 days. And we are sitting here today talking about this. And where is the solutions? Who's sitting down with these business people and, and, and helping these out? I know there is different groups like Interreg or um, Intertrade. Intertrade and stuff like that, making grants. But what, what's need to be done is the representatives from the north, the representatives from the south, making life easier for these people and coming up with solutions for them. And that ain't happening. And that's where the skit, that's, it's the unknown, the uncertainty that is there at the minute. And that's what makes making people very, 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 very afraid. And Chairman, I suppose it's fair, sorry, I'm okay, yeah. fair to say that, you know, there's been an awful lot more support here um, than the, in Northern Ireland it's been very little support for businesses. Um, Intertrade Ireland, as you say, PJ, but Northern Ireland businesses have not had that support for something that's so dramatic. And, you know, a change, uh, you know, all change is always difficult. Um, there hasn't been that support on the northern side of the border. I mean, we heard about Brexit fatigue about a year ago with people here. We haven't had it in Northern Ireland, apart from, you know, my children talk about we're sick listening to that in the news, you know, it's, you know, it's all these bad things, why, why are people continuing with it? Um, but, you know, it's just, there hasn't been that support, there hasn't been that leadership, I don't think, in Northern Ireland, um, and there has been here. Um, and certainly even the Leos and, and whatever have been working um, consistently with businesses as well here. Um, and there's been a number of the workshops and, and that, you know, so we, we just haven't had the same degree. And, and there's the same need, equally the same need in Northern Ireland. Yeah, there really hasn't been, um, Chairman. And, and I, don't, I don't know why it is, the fact that there's no assembly. So there's no focal point to go to, to uh, in the Chambers of Commerce, etc. They're going over to Westminster and Theresa May is coming over here and getting different stories and different visits. So um, I think a lot of small business in particular are just sitting waiting to somebody tell us what the decision is so we can get the paperwork ready if I have to get it ready or no paperwork if I don't have to. And that's basically the, the point they're at. But there's no government-led support in Northern Ireland and we're a remote northwest corner of the UK so we're not a big player in the total scheme of things. Uh, just before I bring uh, Senator Black in, uh, others would have referred to the difficulty with the, inter the electricity interconnector, uh, the impact for yourselves in that respect. Do you want to comment on it? Others would have mentioned issues of um, broadband coverage and indeed the issue of uh, mobile coverage and uh, particularly the in and out across border and the need for uh, people to recognise that those issues need to be addressed. Um, and uh, I know Arnold has mentioned the ab absence of the executive, but you know, clearly we have been told that the postponement of the A5 is based on the fact that uh, arrangements can't be made in that respect. We will be told the same in relation to what is happening with the interconnector. Uh, would anybody com care to comment on, on those issues around broadband? Uh, Say, and the need, a need for us all to start to realise we've got to work together uh, to deliver for our region. Well, in relation to broadband, whatever we've been working together, we've a plan down here for many years, and no harm to it. I don't know where it's going. There's parts of Monaghan we don't have broadband, and the way things are going, the date for the introduction of broadband not being disrespectful, it's the cans being kicked down the road. And that's an issue of a government. You know, that's an issue of a government when they're going to when when they're going to deliver on that. With respect to us coming up as local councillors in this part of the region to try and help the situation, 
like there are people here that are dealing with this and we have resignations and people coming and going in the context of this. Government needs to get its act sorted out in relation to broadband. And that's why they're in here. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I don't think it's been very successful. In relation to the interconnector, there's nobody in County Monaghan stopping the interconnector. Let's be clear about that. It's this perception out there that we're holding up. We are looking for the interconnector to go on the ground. That's what we're looking for. We were told when this came out a number of years ago that it was going to cost 40 times more over ground than it is underground. We're now being told it's going to cost twice. We as a group in Monaghan County Council are 18 councillors from all political persuasions and groups. We don't always agree, but we steadfastly stand together in relation to the interconnector situation. We are not stopping development and we are not saying that we don't want an interconnector. But the people of County Monaghan deserve better. The landowners deserve better. And they have not been given the due respect that they deserve in relation to this issue. We as political groupings stand together with those people, not because it's political, but because it's the right thing to do for our county. There's not a word about Grid West. It's gone by the wayside. I wonder why. We all know why. But what I'm saying to you today is, as the 18 councillors, we have no issue, no issue, with an interconnector. But we want it on the ground. And the people that are looking to do this, and I might as well say it when I'm here, had a planning application in a couple, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, cost the taxpayer seven million and had to be withdrawn. No accountability, no nothing about it. And nobody talking and dealing with the people on the ground. So think about it. Sinn Féin councillors, independents, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. It doesn't happen too often. It certainly doesn't happen in this building where we are united in relation to defending our own county. And we will always do that. But let's be clear, we have no issue with the interconnector. But we do have overground because that's what the people of County Monaghan want and that's what we are elected to do and while we are there we continue to do that. Arnold. Well, in terms of the interconnector, um, I come from the hub of the north, Port of Down, an industrial estate there, a car industrial estate where the Moy Parks and the um, Irwins and all the food industries are all located. And now the situation is that if we don't get a better electricity supply, we can't expand. Development is, not, is held up now in Craigavon because of the lack of the interconnector. Now I can't comment on whether it's overground or underground because if it comes back to the councils for planning, it may well come to my council and I sit in the planning committee, so I have to keep what's known as a, an open mind on the subject. Um, but uh, it's needed from whatever source it comes from, whether it's from Scotland or Dublin, it needs to come to, for order to Northern Ireland to grow. Never mind the border corridor. It, it, it affects us who are only 20 miles from the border. In terms of broadband, it seems to be. I, I was living in Cookieland. I thought that this, the programme you had here in the south was going to roll out a minimum of 80 or something megabytes to every household, fibre to the household, over the next four or five years. So I presumed that that was going ahead, and we were sitting jealously watching from the north, with some places. We have a councillor in our council who uh, lives in Banbridge area. He can't get broadband. He has no broadband whatsoever. Now, you see me there are two contracts floating about at the moment. One is a more local contract um, with BT, which will take uh, fibre to hubs, and then those hubs will circulate out to the businesses. The other one is one where Rather than the way the BT contract has been in the past, where they decide where they start, they normally start at the highest broadband area and work out to the country because there's more money in the, in the centre than there is at the peripherals. We're trying to get a contract which is the opposite. If you go to the worst areas first and work inwards. Now, it needs to be done no matter what way it's done. Thanks very much for your presentation today. and. 
Yeah, as I'm sitting here listening to you, I mean, you know, I realise, you know, it's a minefield, really. You know, it's a, it's a nightmare, you know, that you're, that you're going through. And, and, you know, like, I live in Dublin, you know, and I, and I sometimes feel even here in Leinster House, we're, we're in a kind of cocoon in a way, you know. Um, and I think you really nailed it, PJ, when you said, you know, it's really sad what's happening. And it's really sad what's happening to the people who are on the border, you know. Um, and it's, it's, it's scary. And, I, and, and I'm not sure that, you know, until your presentation today and, and earlier, I mean, I certainly wouldn't have been aware of that huge anxiety, you know, that people, it's almost like the people on the border are forgotten and the border counties are just forgotten, like, you know, and that's the feeling that I'm picking up today. And I, you know, for the people, I, I mean, it must be so scary and it must, the anxiety around it must be awful and businesses, you know, who are constantly worried um, and the impact of that on, in, on, on human beings and then people are going to lose jobs and all of those fears and again you know and i spoke earlier a little bit around this around the mental health side of it you know the impact that of that on people uh, i know myself from my other work that i do my other charitable work that that i do that we're having getting more and more inquiries from the Monaghan area, you know, the Casablaney area, the Dun Dundalk, we're, we've, are we like, we've already got a service up there, but there's a demand for our service in the Monaghan area. And that seems to have only happened, you know, since kind of the referendum in a way. So, it, you know, I really, I mean, I'm really picking up on that. And I suppose my point is that only that you're here today talking about it and the fears and the anxieties and the stresses and the worry and, and it's wonderful that you're all working together I mean that is really powerful it's a it's a fantastic model to see that you're kind of unified in this you know fear I mean it really is and it would you know the fact that you're thinking about you know there's no doubt about it there's there's strength and unity you know and you, you, you spoke Pamela about 20 years ago and how the three organizations work together and you know it would be great it, because there's no doubt about it when you work together Together like that, you, you have to get heard, do you know? Um, and you're fighting for the people in your communities, and that's what's really important. Um, I suppose, you know, my area is mental health. You know, that's the area that I would be most concerned about. My area is mental health and addiction. It's something that I know a lot about, you know, and, you know, that's the one thing for me that I would feel concerned about. Um, and I, everywhere I go, I bring that up. You know, it's like, because I can't imagine, I'm feeling the anxiety. You know, what's it like to be living, you know, in the community with that anxiety all of the time? Um, that's the first thing. So I suppose, what would you, I'm gonna ask the same question as I asked earlier to, to the other group, which was from a, a, our point of view as a committee, what would you like from us? What would you like us to do? You know, um, and is there a specific ask for us as a committee? As we're, you know, we're the Good Friday Implementation Committee. What would you like us to do? And that's really the question I have for you. And um, because, like, we, this is a good committee. We're all very passionate about it. You know, we're all very passionate about the, the Good Friday Agreement, and we're all very passionate about the, the issues that you spoke about today. So. What do you need from us, I suppose, is the main question that, that I, I want to ask. Paula. Well, I suppose I, I think the, the key thing, and certainly um, in my work to date, I've been working for over 20 years in cross-border cooperation, it's that partnership. We can want to do various things along the border and, you know, demonstrate that need. But if we are working in partnership with central government, if the government can work with us, that endorses the work that we're doing. It, we also know then that government is recognising the work. Um, so I, I think the key thing is that we will come up with, based on this, you know, we've outlined disadvantage, it's clear, the border area, north and south, and if the facts are in there, um, we're coming up with some uh, meat on the bones of that. If we can do it in conjunction with, and as I said, the, the, the Taoiseach's office, the Northern Ireland Executive, 
are committed at this minute. They're, they're, they want, they're asking us, what are your requirements? And I think if we can move forward in that manner, we develop this further, we develop our border corridor, call it whatever. Um, but the key thing is, within that, we, we've got our key asks, our priorities, and if government can support us, like for example, the, the Peace Plus programme that we mentioned earlier, 600 million, we would like to see that focused on the border area and, and, and a large part of the interreg aspect of that alongside the peace. Um, what we have found in this current interreg programme, and we're grateful for it, we're managing it, um, financially managing, I should say, it big, large strategic projects. But I think that that programme is very centralised. We are about local delivery that suits the needs of the local people along the border. And government can, the two member states, can influence that programme, that it does deliver on the need that we will outline in the border corridor. So there could be an element of monies there that goes to the border corridor. I mean, the, the, the definition from the EU of a border region is anywhere within 250 miles of the border. But we can demonstrate that the areas closest to the border have the most need of the most deprived. And therefore, we would suggest that those areas should have a, you know, a chunk of cross-border economic development money to assist them. And the cross-border organisations that work on a daily basis there should also be supported. So that would be where I'd say it's central government saying Yes, we recognise and value the work that you're doing, and we'll also put our money where our mouth is and support it. You know, and that needs to come equally from Northern Ireland, because these programmes must, you know, you must have that, that buy-in from Northern Ireland as well. I think that would make a difference to us moving forward. But certainly the peace programme is there to be consulted on. We've taken part in consultations in the past and sometimes wonder, did anybody listen? You know, so I think that would be a key, a key thing moving forward as well. That that um, you know the areas that most need the money, and the areas that are most deprived can benefit from cross border. Sorry, it strikes me that um, from what I've heard today, that you're the meat and the sandwich, and the sandwich is made up of three parts that you have no control over, and that is Brussels, London, and Dublin. Um, Belfast uh, uh, clearly has very little say on what's going on. And, and it just strikes me, listening to the frustration from you today, nobody is going to blink until everybody blinks, and we're 43 days away. And uh, uh, going back to Francis's mental health, I think if I was a business person in Northern Ireland, I would be screaming to the high heavens today. Just give me, they told us that on the 20th of December when we visited Belfast. Just tell us. Hard, soft, we don't care, just tell us. You know, I think we need to push for that, Chair. Thank you. Harold and PJ. Uh, yeah, this page comes as a surprise to Senator Francis. Uh, you know, I see, I thought you came from the North. Valley Castle is it's the same family, isn't it? That comes up from Rattling right, yeah. Island. Yeah. Um, mental health was a big issue in Northern Ireland because there are more bigger problems in terms of per head of the population in Northern Ireland than anywhere else in the UK. So mental health is high on the agenda. And Linda Brands, a former BBC reporter, uh, emphasised that. In terms of specific ask, it may surprise you to think, I think a specific ask we should be you're at the Good Friday Agreement Committee, Implementation Committee. The Good Friday Agreement we have now is not what was agreed in 1998. So I think you need to go back to, whether it's politically possible or not, go back to designation as opposed to largest party. Because as long as you're the two largest parties, could be the first and second minister, you're always going to have division. And that's, you can see that clearly since that agreement was changed to designation as opposed or to change to largest party rather than designation. So that to me is my big ask in terms of if you're ever going to get Northern Ireland up and running properly where there's proper uh, cooperation between all the parties that it is shared fairly and equally amongst the parties. I do support um, Pamela in these 
how we get this structure together, but I think we do need to keep talking. There's bound to be an easy structure without making it too bureaucratic, to which both governments can feel comfortable fitting into. We have the longest record in the East Border region of delivering cross-border programmes, so we think we're in a pole position in terms of delivery, if you just give us the funds to do it. PJ. Yeah, Francis, first of all, can I compliment you in, in relation to the good work that you do? And um, in the context of the words that you use, you use the words forgotten people, I have to be quite blunt and frank. We have an awful lot more in common with the counties in Art of the Bother than we do with counties in Munster and stuff like that. That's a reality. That's a fact. Socially, culturally, we have an awful lot more in common with them. And if you look at the counties along the Bother and you look at the county that I live in, in the last number of years, the majority of people that has created employment in those counties are people that come from Monaghan and come from Cavan. We now realise in there as counties that the people that's going to solve the problems for us are ourselves. And the way forward for us, and you say to us, is there any one thing that you could do, is that hope is given to us. And when I mean hope, I'm talking about how we're going to develop. I, we have an awful lot, I would be in Oma an awful lot more times than I would be in Killarney or Cork, and that's not being disrespectful, because that's the interaction that is along where I live. But one of the saddest things, and I'm going back to the point, and people might say, well, look, it's OK, it's just something that it wasn't going to affect. The A5 was the first thing to go when there was an overspend in a hospital of a building in Europe. The first message that was sent to the people with Brexit 43 days away, that's off the agenda. Now, what message is that sending to the people along the border? And I would ask you, whatever influence you have, that that decision is changed and say, look, at Brexit's coming down the line. These people are going to be living and working in the challenges of that, and we're going to help them as best we can. And I think that type of an understanding and that message given to the people along the border would mean an awful lot. Thank you, PJ. Just uh, a couple of quick comments to bring the to conclusion. But I, just, I think it's important in the day that's in it, having had two of the groupings in and having met the North West uh, out on the ground uh, previously, uh, to pay a tribute, firstly, to all of the committees that are working along the border. But, uh, issue was me mentioned of uh, the local authorities, uh, the various committees and their executives, uh, and particularly the elected representatives that, uh, from both sides uh, who, who are on those, but equally to the communities that have benefited from you, uh, and there are many of them over the last uh, long number of years, and to commend all of those groupings for their work, uh, but particularly on a, on a personal basis as somebody who has uh, live the border, uh, I think, passionate like yourselves about the issues. I think the, the full and frank discussions that have come from yourselves and the earlier grouping today uh, speak for themselves. And um, I, I, while we could be negative, I think we have to be positive and, and, and say what are the solutions that can be found. And I think this committee will look forward to working with you. We've heard what you said. Uh, the, the Secretariat here are taking, uh, obviously, uh, note of what's been said, and hopefully we can find solutions to working together. But I do think the importance uh, of what was referred to area, earlier of the executive up and running, uh, north-south cooperation, uh, east-west cooperation, is the order of the day in order for us to uh, move and progress. So, without any further ado, I want to particularly thank uh, uh, Alderman Hatch, uh, uh, Councillor P. Joe Hanlon uh, and Pamela, but it would be remiss if I didn't make reference to debt and indeed uh, Councillor Gagan and indeed uh, Councillor Terry um, um, Andrews from uh, Newry and Mourne. And, uh, Hopefully that we can have further interaction with you. And to conclude that this won't be the end of the discussion. Uh, we, our next visit is to the Iqban area that's in planning, but we do intend to plan uh, a visit to the region that would take in, I suppose, a day or maybe a little more uh, to actually visit 
projects and talk to communities that would obviously lend weight, hopefully, to what you're saying. So, uh, uh, to bring the meeting to a conclusion, and uh, again to thank you uh, for, for that visitation, and just um, to say on behalf of the Joint Committee that I'd like to thank you for that briefing, but, uh, and I suppose in, in adjourning the meeting to say that uh, we're looking forward to having Simon Coveney here with us uh, at our next meeting, and I'm adjourning that meeting until the 21st of February when the Taunish Minister of Foreign Affairs, I think, will we'll hear not just our views, but the views that are being expressed here around the concerns, uh, be it Brexit, but equally importantly, uh, the, the concerns of the border region in relation to having uh, new programmes put in place, enhanced programmes around peace and, and, and interreg, but indeed to, to give a lead in recognising that there is an economic zone that needs catering uh, from as I say, my own constituency from Carlingford Lock uh, to Lock Foyle uh, and, and beyond. And thank you for your attendance. So the meeting is adjourned until the 21st of February, and thank you for your attendance.